might be live. Okay. I'm hot. It's hot in here. It'll cool down shortly, <laughs> but it is hot. <laughs> All right, the so testing one, two, three. Looks like we have sound. Those of you joining us from YouTube World, if you can let me know if you can hear me, um, go ahead and drop something in the chat. Let me know that you can hear me. And we're going to go ahead and get started. Good morning, guys. A little late. All right. Um, did you guys do the homework? Uh, read chapter one in the yellow book, take the test on 132. Did you grade the test? Okay. You didn't grade the test? Okay, when I call your name, just tell me that you get it to me next week. So the last um, sheet in the book, last page, is your MVP. Down here, it tells you your grading scale. If you missed zero, you get 100. If you missed one, you get a 95. If you missed two, you get a 90, and so on. So if you either tell me how many you missed or what your score is, either way. If you didn't get to it, just say pass. We'll get it from you next week. I know you guys have lives outside of here, and that's okay. Um, don't get too far behind, though, because we are already at the end of week one. The class is a quarter of the way over. So don't get too far behind. You won't be able to get caught up. Okay? Mariah? Thank you. Karina? Zion? Janesty? Jennifer? Rylan? Oh, uh, the homework for chapter one. Oh, uh, how many got right? Yeah, how many got wrong? How many got wrong? Oh, zero. Okay, good. Jashanti? Alana? Alana, I'm sorry. Pass, okay. Desiree? Uh, I didn't grade it. Okay. Allison? Zero. Kristen? Zero. Keely? Zero. Delilah? Zero. Rebecca? I didn't agree yet. Okay, fine. So um, remember that um, over this weekend, you're going to have two chapters to do, chapters two and three. So if you think chapter one was bad, chapter two and three is a whole lot longer. So you're going to have to budget your time accordingly. Anybody ever take a study class teaches you how to study? Okay. If you haven't, um, if you try to sit down and read for hours, your brain is not going to absorb it. Your brain will only absorb about 10 to 15 minutes at a time. So you kind of have to give, you know, it's kind of like Thanksgiving, right? You eat this huge meal and you got to give yourself a little bit of time before you can eat dessert and then you a little bit of time before you can eat a sandwich, right? Because you're full. Well, this is the same way when you're studying. When you're studying, if you break up your um, study into like 15 minute sessions and then give your brain time to digest what you just read, the best way to do that is to get involved in something physical not mental. So if you read for 15 minutes, go walk the dog. Come back read for another 15 minutes, go wash the dishes. Read for another 15 minutes, go play outside with your kid. I mean, something physical but not mental, that gives your brain time and energy to be able to dissect what you just read, catalog it, and throw it into storage. But if you just sit down and open the book and try to read for like two hours, you're not going to remember anything you read. Your eyes will go across the page, but your brain is not engaged. So um, kind of keep that in mind when you're budgeting your time over the weekend for these two chapters because they are long. Okay, good. Questions? 
Does anybody have any questions on chapter one? Anything you read that you're like, I don't understand that. Anybody have any questions? One of the things that usually comes up in chapter one is when you're doing your reading, it tells you that um, you have to have 75 hours of training in order to be certified. If you count up the hours that we're here, we're only here 32. So what does that mean? Well, Florida is the only state that does not abide by that federal gut. We're, we're like outlaws in Florida. We make our own rules, <laughs> right? Florida is the only state does abide by that federal rule. And Florida allows challengers, which means you don't have to have any education, training, or experience to take the tests and become certified. So um, you guys are fine. You don't need that 75 hours to be eligible to test. You're okay. But what this may threat is if you want to move out of the state and transfer your certification another state. Other states know that Florida is a challenge state and they know that you may not have sat in a classroom in order to be eligible to test. So there are some states that go, yeah, no, if you want to be a CNA here, you're going to have to go through our training and testing. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, there's other states like New York. They're like, hey, you got a certification? Cool. We'll take you. Give us a little money, do a background check here, and we'll give you a certification based on the fact that you've got one in Florida. No problem. Okay. So every state that you're looking to go to is going to handle this a little bit differently, but you need to be mindful that um, some states will not allow you to, uh, re it's called reciprocity or reciprocal certification. So that's usually the one thing in chapter one that trips up students when they start adding up hours. They're like, wait a minute, we're short. All right, so any questions on what we went over on Monday? How do we know what to do with each patient? Care plan. Okay, we follow the care plan, the whole care plan in. Nothing, so we're not going to add anything to it, right? Um, when we're following the care plan, what should we, we be looking for? Okay, changes, yeah, abnormalities, changes, pain, if the patient's comfortable, that's a, a good one too. Um, but we should be looking for things that we might need to report. And then who do we report those things to? The nurse. So every skill is going to start exactly the same way with the opening, right? What does every opening start with? A knock. Is that important? Yes. It helps maintain a sense of security for your patient. Please don't forget the knock. Now, I know I'm kind of harping on this, but let me explain to you why. When you guys start practicing in a week and a half, you guys are going to start practicing in here. And I've seen this. I've been doing this 15 years, right? So I've seen a whole lot of you come through. And what ends up happening is that students, when they start to practice, they skip over the whole opening. And they say, I'm just going to practice the skill. Okay, well, the skill includes the opening. Don't skip over that. That is... Remember when we looked at our grading? Remember when we looked at this? Right? You guys remember this? You guys remember this? Did you notice that half of the skill, half of those colored blocks are red and green? So half of every skill is the opening and the closing. If you're skipping the opening and the closing, you're not doing the skill. Good. Make sense? Best place to practice the opening, guys, the best place to practice is in your bathroom at home. Send everybody else out for ice cream because you're going to sound kind of funny talking to your kids. But you have a door to knock on. You have a person to talk to, the one in the mirror. You've got a curtain you can pull for privacy, a sour curtain. And you've got a sink right there to wash your hands. So you should be practicing the opening this weekend 
so much that you can do it without thinking. Every time you walk into the bathroom, every time you walk by the bathroom, every time you think about the bathroom, you should be doing your opening. Hi, Miss Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? I'm here to whatever. Is that okay? Close curtain, wash hands, get supplies. Good? You should be practicing that often because that knock is super important and you won't do it on the test if you're not practicing it in the lab. Good? All right. So every skill starts with the opening. We got that. Good job. What does every skill end with? The closing. And there are lots of C's to the closing. The first four, the order doesn't matter. Can anybody tell me what one of those is? Comfortable. They need to hear that word. Yeah. Clean environment. Sure. Call light. Yeah. What else? Curtain. So comfort, curtain, call light, clean. Once we get all of that, there's going to be another one I'm going to add in there. Your patient needs to be covered at the end of the skill as well, either with clothing or with a sheet, but they need to be covered. So there's another C for you. Um, but once you get all of that done and you're done with the patient, then you're going to go clean your hands. Now, once you've cleaned off all those patient cooties, you don't want to re cootie up. So if you have to come back over here to the bed for any reason, give them their call light, to open the curtain or anything else, what do you need to do again? Yeah, remember, cooties count here, guys. So once you wash them off, don't touch the patient again. Don't touch their environment. In fact, you shouldn't need to go back over to the patient. You should then get your care plan one more time, making corrections, and then tell the evaluator your skill is done. Now, they don't care how you do it. You can say, my task is complete. I'm finished. My skill is done. I, nobody cares how you say it, but you do need to say it. Now, the reason for that, the reason they have this rule in place, and if you forget, they're going to ask you, are you done? You need, to, you need to declare that you're done. Have you guys ever seen a game show? Yeah. Right? For game shows, you have to hit that buzzer, and you're locking in your final answer. You can't change it. That's it. Right? So saying you're done is your final answer. You are declaring, I don't need to make any more corrections past this point. So when you declare that your skill is done, you can't go back and make corrections. Okay, so they're going to put that in your hands. Now, if you forget, they're going to remind you, um, are you done? Because they won't let you move on to the next skill until this one is done. Now, I just got an email uh, that came, uh, I get emails and, and comments from all over the country. But I got an email from somebody that's getting ready to test. And her question was, and it's a good question. Her question was, since it's the same patient, like this person over here, do I have to do my opening and closing uh, three times? Can I just do the opening at the beginning of the first skill, do all three skills, and then do the closing at the end? And it's a good question, right? Because patient looks alike. Well, during the test, they're actually going to give you very specific instructions on this. They're going to tell you to treat this like three separate patient encounters. So you're, you have to do your opening, skill, closing, wash hands. Do your opening, wash hands, skill, closing, wash hands. Do your opening, wash hands, skill, closing, wash hands a lot of hand washing. So um, during the test, after your first, where do those evaluators want to be? Home in the pool. Uh-huh. Drinking there. Martini. Yeah. Mai Tais, martinis, daiquiris, whatever you got. <laughs> they do not want to be watching you wash your hands six times. They got better things to do. So after your first skill, when you're all done with your first so you washed your hands, you did your skill, you did your closing, you washed your hands again. After that, at some point, they're going to tell you you can simulate hand washing. Remember, simulate means 
say. So I would wash my hands here. Make sense? That just shortens the whole test so that those evaluators can get back to their pools. Good? Question? Do not simulate until you are told to. Very important. Because if you made a mistake, they may watch another one and grade that one instead. Okay, good. Little known test figure there. All right. So you guys ready to move on to another um, skill? Another concept? Okay. Good morning, Stella. All right, so go ahead and turn in your white skills books to page 66. How do we know what to do with each patient? Care plan. Care plan. Care plan. This care plan tells us to provide mouth care to a resident who has teeth. So we're going to learn denture care a little bit later on in the program. So for those of you who have that question, yes, we will learn that later. This patient has teeth. So we have to learn how to brush them. How many guys have brushed your teeth this month? Good job. Okay, Dennis will be proud. Um, the process is not much different. You wet a toothbrush, you put some toothpaste on it, rub a dub dub, rinse, Fit, clean your mouth afterwards, right? You're gonna dry it off, right? That process is pretty much the same. What is different is the patient is laying in bed. Is that a safe position? So we've got to get them in an upright position. Now, that may mean putting the head of the bed up. That's like the simplest answer, right? And that's what will work for the test. But if your patient can sit up on the side of the bed, that's even better. Okay, but you need them in an upright position. Good? Make sense? What do you think is going to happen to your score if you don't get the patient in an upright position? Yeah. So when we're talking about the head of the bed, let me, um, we're going to come back to this in a second, but let me talk to you about the head of the bed real quick. When we're talking about the head of the bed, The bed controllers are in different places on different beds. On this bed, it's actually on the uh, positioning rail. This is not a side rail. This is a positioning rail. We'll get into that a little later. On that bed, it's a little controller at the end of the bed. I'm going to take onto the end of the bed so we don't lose it. So uh, um, every bed is going to have a little bit different controller mechanism. Make sense? When you put the head of the bed up, you have to go until it stops, not until you think it's high enough, okay? So a very frequently, um, oh, hold on, you guys can see me. Um, a very frequently missed checkpoint here is uh, the head of the bed. So a lot of people will put the head of the bed up but they won't put it up as far as it needs to go. Hold. Right where? Right where? Oh, thank you. <laughs> I don't bend like I used to.
I've actually ordered a um, mount for my camera on the wall over there. We're going to be putting that up hopefully today so to get that tripod out of the way. But the problem is that um, if my little handy dandy thing doesn't work, then I'm not going to have the ability to turn it. So I'm going to make sure this thing works. All right. So here's our bed. So what a lot of people will do is they'll put the head of the bed up. Yeah, something like this. And they'll say, yeah, that looks good. That's not good. The patient is still in a reclining position. We have gravity on her. Is anybody familiar with gravity? Yeah. If your patient is laying back, gravity is going to pull liquid. Liquid is light down. So that liquid is not going to go forward. It's going to go down. And your patient is at risk of aspiration or liquid in the lungs. So this is not good enough. We have to put this bed in the full upright sitting position. So that means we're going to be here a little bit, a little while. So that is the full upright sitting position. Do you guys see the difference there? Okay, this is a hospital bed. Um, these are a little bit more extensive. They do more things, more bells and whistles. And what happens with a hospital bed is the knees actually come up too. And that kind of keeps the patient, you know, the bottom of the patient in bed. That one doesn't. That one, just the head of the bed goes up. And what ends up happening is the patient kind of slides down the bed over time. Um, so this is, a, this is an improvement. It helps. But if you thought this bed was slow, that one is really, I mean, you can play checkers in the time it takes to get the head of the bed up. Now, the reason for that, there's actually a reason for it. Remember, our patients are not healthy. They're sick or injured, right? So if we have a head of a bed that goes, woo, and they're up, if they're nauseous, they're going to throw up. If they're not feeling well and they're dizzy, they might pass out. Um, if they're having pain, the pain is going to intensify. So we don't want anything that's going to move rapidly. We need something that moves very, very slowly. But you guys are going to be so focused on all of the tasks that you have to do. You've got all of these care plans to follow, all of these things to do. You don't have time to stay here and hold this button for that long so you tend to take shortcuts. Don't take shortcuts. Remember, you're being paid by the hour. Head of the bed all the way up. Good? Make sense? Okay. So that is a very, very important um, distinction. See how long this is? <laughs> I mean, really, we could go out to breakfast. Now for this particular bed, you guys are practicing and playing. Notice I put the head of the bed up, but what happened to the knees? It stayed up. Stayed up. So to get this bed flat, there's a control here. Um, for the head and the knees, you want to put the knees down too. Okay, good. So hospital bed 101. All right. So our care plan at the top of the page tells us a resident with natural teeth is lying in bed and needs mouth care. The resident is not able to provide their own mouth care. So that means we're going to do it for, for them. I guarantee you, if they can do their own mouth care, they will do their own mouth care. Nobody wants some stranger in their mouth unless it's absolutely necessary. If I came to your house at 6.30 tomorrow morning, which is not likely to happen because I don't like mornings, but if I came to your house at 6.30 tomorrow morning and said, what's your name? Zion. Zion, open up. I'm going to brush your teeth. And you're perfectly capable of brushing your own teeth. What are you going to think? I'm crazy. Absolutely. There is something wrong with me. Yeah. Your patients feel the same way. If they can brush their own teeth, they do not want you in their mouth doing it. So how do we know what teeth we're going to brush and what teeth we're not? Care the care plan. 
If the patient can brush their own teeth, it's going to have mouth care ad lib. Now, that term ad lib means as the patient wishes. You do everything ad lib. You are in control of your own destiny, right? But if the patient can't do it, then my care plan would tell me to perform mouth care every morning and evening. Good? Make sense? That's how we know what we're going to do on each patient. But remember that we're not doing this on everybody. However, if we do have to do mouth care, do it well. Do it well. Um, don't take shortcuts here. You don't have to rush for a whole two minutes. Nobody's timing you. It's nothing like that. But you want to do a good job. And let me tell you a story about this. This was horrible. Oh, now you can't see me again. I need a production assistant. <laughs> Cameraman. All right. So let me, good morning, Gregory. And good morning, Kayoma. Um, let me tell you a story about this. So many years ago, many, many, many years ago, I was working in a um, hospital step-down unit when I was also working part-time for an agency that sent uh, nurses out uh, to like substitute nurses for facilities. It's called agency work. And um, this patient that was in the hospital, he had been, he was a young man, had been riding a motorcycle, lost control, hit a tree, no helmet, Close head injury. It was bad. It's in the ICU for weeks. He's paralyzed from the neck down. It's kind of a horrible way to start your life. And um, life was not going real great for him. Now, the problem was he was going to have to be transferred to a nursing home because his family didn't have the ability to take care of him at home. So here he is in his early 20s. He's going to live out the rest of his life in a nursing home. I mean, how depressing is that? That's that's like, you know, the motorcycle ads, they don't sell you into that, right? They just make it look fun. <laughs> if you're going to wear a motorcycle, wear a helmet. So this uh, particular young man transferred out of the ICU and into the step-down unit, which happened to be where I was working. And... Um, course I knew the plan that he was going to go to a nursing home and because I worked in nursing homes part-time I knew that this was particularly depressing but um, we had that guy for probably about two or three days and I noticed he really wasn't talking a lot now he still had the ability to talk he was paralyzed but he still had the ability to talk and he was paralyzed from like here down mid chest and um I went in one day and I'm asking him questions and he's got, you know, he keeps turning his head away from me and giving me one word answers. Now, I'm thinking the guy's probably depressed. Seems reasonable, right? So I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to get a hold of the doctor. We're going to get a psych consult. I mean, if anybody needs one, this guy certainly does. He's had serious life changing alterations. But I started thinking a little bit beyond that. And I also noticed that he wasn't chewing real well. So I asked him, are you having any pain? You know, it, how's your mouth? Is everything okay in there? And now remember, he went face first into a tree, right? So he's got some, some trauma. And I'm thinking along those lines. And he started crying. Now, this is horrible starts crying. All I'm asking him is, do you have any mouth pain? And he's crying. And I'm like, what's going on? What, talk, talk to me. Tell me what's going on. He says, my teeth haven't been brushed since the accident. And I know that my breath smells horrible. This poor kid is paralyzed from the chest down is going to spend the rest of his life in a nursing home. And what is he concerned about? His breath. All right. My mind, he's got bigger fish to fry, but not in his. So is this important? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I just, what? What? 
Nobody has brushed your teeth in the weeks that you have been here. And I mean, he's just crying and he's shook his head. Oh my God. Let me get in there and do that because I got to find out, you know, do we have any facial trauma? I mean, that's like a whole part of the body we miss, right? So I got to get in there, do mouth care. I'm going to take a look. We're going to do some um, uh, assessment. I'm going to get a hold of the physician. We're going to get a dental consult in there. He ended up having to have multiple teeth pulled from this episode because nobody brushed his teeth. Yeah. Horrible. 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 It can also cause heart issues. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Dental and cardiac are tied very closely. We don't really understand the mechanism of that action, of how dental hygiene affects your cardiac status. There's been a lot of studies on it, but we don't really have any clear, definitive link. But it does. We've shown multiple times that it does. So very, very good point. So if we have to brush somebody's teeth, do a good job. Right? So we're going to learn how to do that. But before I show you how to brush teeth, and the reason I start you off with this one is because it's a skill you already know. We're just brushing teeth, guys. Your stress level should be pretty much down here, right? Right? First skill is something I already know how to do. Yay. We just have to learn how to do it on someone else. And that is a few um, concessions we have to make. So we're going to get into that. Remember that mouth care is an ADL, and that's what we do. What does ADL stand for? Yeah, they're repetitive actions that are done every day by the patient. If the patient can't do it, we're going to step in and do it for them or help them with it. So let's get into the specifics of mouth care. So if you look at this, let me find it for you. Uh. Okay, so if we look at this, this is our uh, checklist, right? This is our checklist. Notice how much on this checklist is red and green. What does that tell us? Opening and, closing. Opening and closing. You already know those two. So not much there that we have to learn beyond that, right? So we already know opening and closing. But there's a couple new colors on here. That means we got to learn a few new principles. And that's what we're going to do. But anything without a color is what you see here. These are skill specific. I was going to make these boxes black, but then it would be hard to see. So I just left them white. Okay. So these are skill-specific steps. These are things that we absolutely positively have to do to get this thing checked off. So first, the patient must be sitting fully upright. Well, that makes sense, right? Don't want to kill our patient. We want to protect the clothing. Oh, that kind of makes sense, too. We talked about that on Monday. We want to wet the toothbrush before applying toothpaste. Let me talk to you about that because some of you don't do that. You just put toothpaste on a dry toothbrush. And that might be fine at home because you can adjust the amount of water that's in your mouth as you need to. But when we're working with other people, we have to wet the toothbrush first before we apply the toothpaste to make sure that it spreads around evenly and you don't get this big clump over here and nothing over here. So we have to make sure we wet the toothbrush first before applying toothpaste. And guys, that is actually a checkpoint. That's how important that is. It's actually a checkpoint. You're gonna brush all surfaces and the tongue. You're gonna to allow the patient to rinse and spit. Oh, that just makes sense, I got toothpaste in there. And we're going to leave the patient's face and clothing dry. So nothing earth shattering here, right? But those are the checkpoints here that are in white. This is this. Now, in your book, on page 66, you have step-by-step -step instructions that tells you how to do this. Okay. Good? 
Question? So let me ask you guys a question real quick. We're going to time out from the class for just a second. I am in the process of rewriting the book that you're using, okay? And I was working on the edit last night. Would this be helpful to have in the book, this banner? Would you like this on each skills page? Yes. Okay. All right. So I needed that input from students because it changes the layout of the page significantly to try to fit that in there. Um, so I needed to get input from students whether you felt that would be helpful. Will we do it in No, no, you guys, because it take, I got, I'm finishing up the edits now and then I got to send it to printing so you guys will be long gone before it gets uh, printed. Um, will we be performing, since this is one of the things that we are required to do as a skill for our test, we will have to actually brush the teeth of the person we are. Right. If you look at the bottom of the page, on page 66, it tells you that somebody with your level of experience should be able to do this in 12 minutes or less. Guys, it is, has it ever taken you 12 minutes to brush your teeth? Mm -hmm. Lots of time there. Lots of time. <laughs> but it tells you in the next section that this is going to be done on a live testing student. So if you remember, on Monday, we talked about the test, and I paired you up in a group of two, and I said, you're going to do your skills on her, and she'll do her skills on you. Well, this is a live patient skill, so you may be getting your toothbrush during the test. I know. Nobody likes it. I get it. I, I get it. But if you think it's awkward, how do you think your patient's going to feel about it? So I think that this is a good thing for us to walk in our patient's shoes once in a while so that we understand the discomfort and we can adjust our approach accordingly. Good? Make sense? Okay. So, yeah, I know it's kind of icky. Nobody, nobody volunteers for this ever. Um, <laughs> I get it. But it's, um, it's kind of a necessary thing. Now, you guys have um, these on the table. You can always take a picture of them. That's fine. I don't have these for you in your book yet. Okay, so you can take a picture. You've also got this um, presentation. You can go back and watch it. How, did you guys get my uh, after class one email, wrap up email? Did it go out? Technology, not my strong suit. All right, so. Oh, I have another question. Yes. So all, so I'm looking. I'm reading this. Like we have to do all these 21 steps in order. Yes. Okay. So let me give a caveat to that. Okay. There are very few things on the test that are order specific like wet the toothbrush before you apply toothpaste, right? That's order specific. And um, during the opening, we have to get permission before we close the privacy curtain. We've got to wash our hands before we get clean supplies, right? The rest of it, the order doesn't matter as much. Now I had to pick an order to put, you know, on paper, but if you do the top before you do the bottom, nobody cares, you know? The things that the order matters, I always pull out and talk about, okay? Why we want to wash our hands after we close the curtain. Why? Okay. Why do we want to wash our hands before we get clean supplies? Yeah, we want clean hands, right? So does that kind of make sense? Why do we wet a toothbrush before applying toothpaste? Okay, so the things that are order specific, I'm always talking about and explaining the why behind it to make sure that you kind of get it. Does that make sense? The rest of it really doesn't matter too much. Um, you know, but think about how you would want this done. That, that's really kind of the big thing. Now, we are going to get into some infection control principles in just a few minutes. And the order for that does matter um, when we're talking about infection control. But you just asked, do I need to basically memorize all 21 steps, right? There's 21 steps there. 21, right? Yeah. yeah. And you just basically asked, do I have to memorize? I really have to do all 21 steps. 
right? So we learned on Monday the opening. Right, right. So knock, knock, knock. Hi, Miss Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. I'm here to whatever. Is that okay? Close curtain, wash hands, get supplies, right? You should now know all of those steps in, in your mind. By Monday, you should have them down cold, right? Because you're going to practice, aren't you? lie to me. It's okay. All right. So instead of learning 21 steps, it would be a whole lot easier to just learn maybe five or six, right? So if you look here, this is what I'm going to talk to you about now. If you look here, you'll see that we're going to follow the care plan. We know what this stands for now, don't we? We follow the care plan, the whole care plan, and what are we looking for? Changes. And who are we reporting them to? Okay, so we know exactly what that that puzzle piece rec, uh, represents now. We don't need all those steps. All we need is this one puzzle piece to remind us. We know the opening. Knock, knock, knock. Hi, Miss Bones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. I'm here to whatever. Is that okay? Close curtain, wash your hands, get supplies. We know what that green puzzle piece represents, right? Now we're going to learn a couple more. One, two, three, four. Oh, we got a lot of learning to do today. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to learn mouse hair steps, which we've already been over. And we're going to do the close, which is like nine steps. Right? So instead of learning 21 steps, let's learn one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's a whole lot easier, isn't it? If you know that every single skill that we do, every single skill that we do has the skill rules because we have to know what we're doing, has the opening, we have to evaluate if we need gloves, and we're going to do the closing. Those four steps are in every single skill. So those are kind of gimme, right? Every single skill has those four steps. So we don't even have to really worry about those because they're always there. So if we break those four out now, we only really have five to worry, worry about, including mouth hair. Does that make sense? So five, you guys can learn five steps, right? That's easy. Super simple. This is why these principles is why my students do well. I actually created this system. It's now being used all over the country because it's easy and it's all about easy. If I make this super complicated, you might pass the test. But when you get out there to work, are you going to keep up with all this complicated rules and stuff? No, you're going to do it your own way. If I make it easy, you're more likely to keep doing it the right way out there where it really matters. Does that make sense? It's good. Okay, so remember our rules for this skill. Patient must be sitting fully upright. We're gonna protect the clothing. We're gonna wet our toothbrush before applying toothpaste. We're gonna brush all surfaces and the tongue. Notice it does not tell us the time. You don't have to brush for two minutes. Just get it all done. You're gonna brush the tongue. Oh, makes sense. It's part of the mouth. You're gonna let them uh, rinse and sit and dry them off afterwards. Easy peasy, right? All right. So let's learn how we're going to do this. So right now we're going to go to page 26. And we are going to talk about gloves. So let me go back real quick. This principle of glove rules is going to be found in every single skill that we do. So we're going to learn it first before we do mouth care, and it's going to make up one of our big four, okay? So here's your club rules. This is what it looks like. It's also on the back wall. Notice how everything goes together? Mm -hmm. All right, 
so as always, if you see this little video clapboard thing, it means I have a movie on this. And you can go watch the movie. I'm not going to show it to you in class. We're going to talk about it in person rather than showing you the movie. But you may want to go back and watch that video because it may help kind of explain a few things if you get fuzzy afterwards, okay? But I find that it's actually easier to teach you about gloves if we don't really talk about using gloves in medicine. That, that's not really what I want to focus on today. We're going to learn it a little bit differently, okay? So let's build a sandwich. You ever go to a sandwich shop where they build a sandwich right in front of you? No, we're going to build one together. And I'm going to build a sandwich. You're going to tell me what to do here. We're going to do this exercise together. Now, before I build your sandwich, what am I going to put on? Why? You don't want me to touch your food, do you? And that's kind of gross to have a stranger touching your food. You will feel much better if I put some gloves on. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to put those little plastic food service gloves on. And I'm going to ask you, what kind of bread would you like? White? Okay. So I'm going to go over. Oh, there's the gloves. Okay. I'm going to go over here to the bread cart. And I'm going to lift that flap. And I'm going to pick out a loaf of bread. Okay. Do we want a full sub or a six inch? Okay. So I'm going to pick up that knife. Cut the bread in half open the little bread container thing on the, the counter and put the other half in there for later, right? Everybody good? Okay. Now I'm going to take that same knife and I'm going to cut the bread in half and then I'm going to fold it over so it's nice and open. So now that we have our bread prep, what would you like for condiments? Do you want um, mayonnaise? Oh, um, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to reach into the mayonnaise little container thing. And it's always got that spreader thing sticking out. I'm going to pick that up and spread the mayonnaise on the, the bread and put the spreader thing back. You want honey mustard too? Yes, Okay. So we're going to get uh, some honey mustard, pick up the container, tap it on the counter, put some honey mustard on our uh, bread. So, so far, I'm happy with this, right? We're good with this. Looks like a good sandwich. Okay, what kind of meat would you like? Okay. <laughs> How about, if, well, let me ask you this. How about, do you want bacon on your sub? Let's ask that first. You want bacon? Everybody wants bacon. Bacon's good, right? So I'm going to reach in this little um, package, and I'm going to get a couple strips of bacon before we start building the sandwich. And now what would you like for lunch meat? Ham, turkey, roast beef, turkey. Mm. Yummy. So I'm going to, under the counter, open that little refrigerator up. I'm going to get the package of turkey, close the refrigerator, take that knife that was laying on there, cut the turkey in half, because we're only doing a half a sub. I'm going to open the refrigerator, put the other half of the turkey back in, close the refrigerator, and then I'm going to put the turkey on the sandwich. So, so far, so good, right? Okay. Okay. What about cheese? Provolone. Provolone. Okay, so I don't have any provolone in this little refrigerator, so I'm going to go over here to the cheese drawer, open it up, and look for the block of provolone, um, and it's not there either. So I'm going to need to go into the walk-in cooler. So I'm going to open the walk-in cooler. I'm going to, we're going to get there. I'm going to open up all the um, containers, find the one with provolone, close the containers, close the uh, the um, freezer, but I've got to slice that provolone, right? Doesn't come pre-sliced, I've got to slice it. So I'm gonna go over to the slicer and slice that provolone cheese and put it on top of our meat. Well, put the bacon on now as well. So do we want this toasted? Yeah. Absolutely. So we're gonna get this toasted, because that sounds good, right? We got bacon and cheese and turkey. So let's toast this. We're gonna wait because the toaster is being used. So usually we kind of put our hand on something while we're waiting, just kind of hang out a little bit. And once it's our turn, we're going to uh, put the sandwich in, turn the dial for the amount of time. Once it hangs, we're going to open the, the toaster, 
And then, in order to get it out, we got to have that paddle thing. Oh, this with the gloves on? Yeah. We're going to talk about that, right? We're going to talk about it. So we're going to use that paddle to get our, our sandwich out, and we're going to put it on the counter. Now, lettuce. Sure. So we're going to reach our gloves in to that big bin of lettuce and get some out and sprinkle it on our sandwich. How about some tomato? Okay, I'm going to get a couple pieces of tomato and lay them out on the sandwich. Would you like olives, peppers, onions? Yes, yeah, so I'll get a little bit of olives, put them on, a little bit of peppers, put them on, a little bit of onions, put them on. How about some um, uh, garlic pickles? You want the garlic pickles? So I'm going to get the garlic pickles. You really have to squeeze those out because they get all drippy, right? We'll put those on. Oil, vinegar, salt, pepper. So I'm going to get the oil container, the vinegar container, the salt, and the pepper. And now I'm going to wrap it up, right? So I'm that, um, oh, I'm sorry. In order to wrap it up, we have to shove that knife that we used earlier inside to fold it over and hold everything in to fold it over, right? And then we're going to wrap it up. Yep. Now, are we ready to eat that sandwich? Not with my young <laughs> but wait, you guys said that you were happy I was wearing gloves. We're going to talk about that in a minute. We'll talk. Don't freak out quite yet. Did you realize how many things those gloves cut? It's a little bit eye opening, isn't it? All right, let's just take a look quickly, just because I've got the slides. Let's take a look at everything that those gloves touch, right? So did those gloves do what you really thought they were doing? Okay, that's important. So those gloves touch the outside of the bread cart, the knife, the mayonnaise spreader, the sauce bottles, the outside of the bacon package, the cheese drawer, the door handle, the uh, containers inside the cooler, the slicing machine, the table, the toaster oven, the toaster oven control, the paddle, the lettuce, tomato, and other toppings, the wrapper, all of that. Now, we didn't think about that before we ordered our sandwich, and you wouldn't have thought about it unless I brought it to your attention today. You would have been perfectly happy going out for a sandwich after this lecture. No problem. Now you're going to think twice. So what changed? Did the effectiveness really change or did your awareness of it change? Awareness. Yeah. They're not changing. I mean, this is going to be, you go to a sandwich shop right after this, and it's going to be made just like this. Right? But is that really reasonable? I mean, are, are they really going to change their... Look at all those things. Let's go back a slide. Hold on. Look at all those things. You're really going to change your gloves? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 times? Okay, so we've got to think about this, right? We kind of have to think this through. It's not just good enough to throw on a pair of gloves and be done with it. There's a whole lot more that goes into this, right? Now, I'm going to tell you, you guys are all safe to eat sandwiches. It's okay because you've got a healthy functioning immune system that needs to work out now and then. And this is okay. All right? Don't stop eating sandwiches just because of this. But I definitely would stay away from buffet. <laughs> okay? Don't get me started there. But we need to be aware of all the things the gloves touch. Now, this is just a sandwich in a pretty clean environment, right? It's just a sandwich. We're not talking about a clinical setting with patients that have big, bad, ugly germs. So if we aren't happy here, then we really need to think about what we're going to do here. Make sense? I get to look at gloves just a little bit differently today? All right. So in order to understand this, we have to figure out were the gloves effective? So 
you're going to say no, but let me, let, let me back you up just a minute. Were those gloves effective? So at the beginning, you thought those gloves were there to protect your sandwich, right? That's what you thought. Yeah, you, you thought those gloves were there to protect your sandwich. But what if those gloves were not there to protect your sandwich? What if they were there to protect the worker who had an allergy to something? Were they effective then? So when you're judging whether gloves are effective, you have to figure out who are you trying to protect here? Does that make sense? Okay. So we can't just automatically say, no, those gloves were not affected or effective because she touched everything and touched my sandwich, right? Because we don't know who are those gloves really there to protect. We don't know. So in healthcare, I have to ask you those, this question. Who are those gloves there to protect? What do you guys think? <coughs> okay. Everyone. So that means we have to look at this a little bit differently, right? It's not just there. We're not wearing gloves because some policy procedure tells us to. We're wearing gloves because we're trying to protect both sides of this equation. Now, I am going to tell you that your side really doesn't really doesn't matter all that much. It really, and I'm going to give you three examples of why it doesn't matter all that much. If you're wearing gloves to protect you, you kind of miss the point um, at the end. <laughs> I still have a long way to go with it. But really, those gloves aren't there to protect you the way you think they are. They're really there to protect the patient. Now, why would that be? Why do you think we have to protect the patient? Okay, yeah, remember on day one, we talked about the fact that we put all of our sickest people in the same building, and these are big, bad, scary, ugly germs, right? And so we've got a germ-rich environment and we have a patient whose immune system is currently occupied. Those two things do not go together. Does that make sense? So germ-rich environment, no immune system. That's scary stuff. Super scary stuff. So who do you think those gloves really should be there to protect? The patient, 100%. So that means that we've got to be aware of what we're touching. Remember, germ-rich environment. Now, the problem is that when you are going to wear gloves, you're going to want to put them on immediately. Like, as soon as you walk in the room, it's the first thing you're going to want to do. And I'm going to explain to you why that's a bad idea. But we'll get there. All right. In order to understand this, we have to talk about the chain of infection. This is in your book somewhere. Hold on, I gotta find you the page. I should have it on there, but I don't. 85. All right, so the way the chain of infection works, this is how pathogens are spread. There we go. This is how pathogens are spread. So the first thing that we have to have is a pathogen. No pathogen, no problem, right? So first thing we have to have is a pathogen. If we don't have a pathogen, it can't spread. So if nobody in this room has hepatitis B, then we certainly aren't at risk of developing hepatitis B. No pathogen, no problem. Make sense? But once we have a pathogen, now we got a problem. That pathogen has to have a place to live. A pathogens don't, when I say pathogens, I'm talking about viruses and bacteria and fungi and parasites and those types of things, bad guys, right? But they don't exist out in nature very well. They really, they, they aren't good homeless. They really aren't. They're not very resourceful and they will either go dormant or die. 
So most pathogens have to have a place to live. And the human body is awesome. Three-story, deluxe model, you know, great place to live. Every pathogen wants to cuddle up inside a patient or a you. Okay. So as long as that pathogen is inside its home, it's not a threat to anybody. It can't escape through the skin. It has to have a doorway to get out. Now, a doorway can be any natural body opening, eyes, ears, nose, mouth, genitals, rectal area. But it also could be a different type of opening, like a wound, a rash a sore or an incision, right? But it has to have a way out. As long as it's inside the bag of bones, it's no real threat to anybody. It's only when it finds its way out. Now, this can be a couple of different things. Anybody hear of um, COVID? If not, you've been living under a rock, right? This is what made COVID so scary in the very beginning because we did not know how the virus, what exit it was using, okay? Because a virus that um, has to bleed on somebody is way different than a virus that can escape on air particles. Way different, right? So if you're bleeding, you're, you're really not at risk, but she's like way over here, right? They don't fly. That's the thing. Pathogens don't walk or fly. They don't have legs or wings. Pathogens have to have a vehicle. Where is it? A vehicle. They have to have a way of getting around. So if it floats or flows, could be. Maybe, right? So airborne floats, blood and body fluid flow, okay? So what we have to figure out is when COVID came on the scene, which way does this pathogen get out of its host and travel? And at first we thought that COVID floated. We thought it was airborne, okay? Make sense? We also thought that it spread by contact, which means that, you know, you cough, you got stuff on your hands, you touch stuff, and then it was spread to other people. We've since found out that that doesn't happen. So COVID is mainly spread through droplets and airborne. There's actually very, very few pathogens that spread through the air. Do you guys know that? Very few pathogens. Like I can count on one hand the amount of pathogens that actually spread through the air. And that's what made COVID so scary because it does spread through the air. Um, but until we have time to kind of study this and get a lay of the land, we got to figure out how to protect everybody until we know what we're dealing with here. Make sense? So now we know what COVID is all about. We know how it gets out of the body through facial secretions. We know that it floats and uh, goes on droplets, so we know the environment can have be contaminated. So we know it's mode of transmission. So these are the two things that I'm concerned about when I'm talking about infection control. Okay. Now, just because I have something in the wild, so let's go back to hepatitis B for a second. Let's say that you have hepatitis B. And it's inside your body. It's not doing anybody any damage. You're keeping it nice and warm and safe and happy and life is good. But if you accidentally get a cut on you and you're bleeding, right? So we have a cut and now we're bleeding. Well, now we're at a little bit more risk, just a little bit more risk because we have a pathogen. It's a safe and it's traveling. Okay. But there's another part of this equation that has to be in place for us to really be in danger. And that is the pathogen has to have a way in. So these doors are just like these doors. So natural body openings, eyes, nose, mouth, genitals, rectal area, but you also have wounds, rashes, sores, and incisions. 
Make sense? So as long as you have no wounds anywhere on you, no body openings, and you're not licking up for blood, right? That pathogen, even though it's out in the wild, isn't going to get inside you. It has to have a way in. On is not good enough. Right? Good? Okay. So if the pathogen is lucky enough to get inside you, it finds a doorway in, then you have to be susceptible to it. So back to our analogy. You've got hepatitis B, spring a leak, you're bleeding. She somehow licks it up. I don't know why. And now she has hepatitis B inside of her. Still not complete. This is not a complete infection yet because she has to be susceptible. And in seventh grade, we got her hepatitis B series. So now her immune system knows how to identify the hepatitis B, how to kill it. You are not a susceptible host. So the infection stop there. You can't get it, so you're not going to spread it. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to kind of time out for just a second and explain the immune system in a quick and easy way. Okay? So let's say that we're sitting in this classroom, and there's a whole bunch of bad guys out there on the sidewalk waiting to come in. Whole bunch of bad guys. Now the first one burst through the door and you see him first. Now you're gonna try to get rid of him before he can do any damage. So you're gonna pick up your highlighter, because that's all you got available to you, and you're gonna throw it at him. And it doesn't do any damage. So he's gonna run back out and he's gonna tell all the other bad guys out there, hey, she's got a highlighter She's going to throw it to you or throw it at you. So when you go in the door, bob and weave to the right. It'll miss you. Okay. So now they've got insider information. You really didn't help us. So next bad guy comes in and you're going to attack them. And you've got that nice big heavy cup. You bash him over the head with the cup and it makes him a little bit dizzy, but doesn't kill him. He runs back outside and he says, okay. First person has the highlighter, second person has a cup, wear a helmet. So the third bad guy comes in, and you're next in line. You grab that fire extinguisher behind you, and you bash him over the head, and it does a little more damage. He's hurting for certain now, but he manages to escape and goes out there, and, he's, and he tells everybody out there, hey, highlighter, cup. Fire extinguisher. It didn't do as much damage because they learned from her to wear a helmet. Okay. Man. So the fourth guy comes in and you're like, okay, we're done here. Right. I I'm going to pull out the big guns. And you pull out a gun and you shoot him and he's dead. Good job. Right. No more bad guys. All the rest of that guy scared, run away. Good. Make sense? Okay. That is how the immune system works. Everything we throw at it that does not work, that pathogen uses for information. You ever hear that you always have to take all of your antibiotics? Even after you start feeling better, you've got like four more days of antibiotics left. And you're like, this is stupid. I'm going to put these in the um, medicine cabinet for later. If I ever get another infection, they're there for me, right? Bad idea. No, bad idea. Because all you did is kill enough pathogens to make you feel better, but there's still some inside you that now have the secret formula. So the next time you try to kill those pathogens with that antibiotic, it's not going to work. It's even worse, if you pass that pathogen on to her, the antibiotics aren't going to work in her either. So when they tell you to take all of your antibiotics, this is why. Because we're teaching our pathogens all of our defenses. Make sense? 
but the system also works for us as well. So if we get a pathogen and we end up killing it inside of us, we overcome it, we get better. Now our immune system has detailed notes of exactly what to expect. So if that pathogen shows back up, we don't have to go through the highlighter in the cup in the fire extinguisher. We go straight for the big guns. We know what works. Does that make sense? And this is why you're okay to eat your sandwich. Because you're giving your immune system information in very small doses. We've actually found it's bad for our immune system to isolate. Because our immune system isn't getting worked out. So what happens if you spend your entire life on a couch? You get all flabby, right? Yeah, exhibit A. <laughs> so if we don't work out our immune system, it's not going to be as effective as it needs to be. So go out and have your sandwiches. It's okay. You've got a healthy immune system. But if you're on chemotherapy, I'm probably going to tell you that eating out is probably not a good idea. Why? Why would it be okay for you, but not for somebody on chemotherapy? That's right starting to see that we have to make some accommodation. So does this make sense to you? The chain of infection? The big takeaways here that I want you to remember is that pathogens are happy living in their houses. They don't want to leave. They're nice and warm and comfortable and they only leave if they find a door. And then they have to have a way of getting around. Remember, they don't fly on their own. They don't crawl, there's no legs, so they have to float or flow to their new destination. And once they get to the new destination, then they have to find a doorway in. No doorway, no problem. So if you've got a cut on your hand and you're working in medicine, what do you think you should do? Wear gloves. Yes, cover it, absolutely, absolutely. Because you don't want a doorway in. We also don't want to be susceptible. We actually have control over that to a certain extent. We can make sure that our nutrition is good. We're well, well rested. Our immune system is in tip top shape. We're not going to work when we're sick and our immune system is compromised, right? We have some control over this. We can also make sure that we're up to date on our vaccinations, right? Hepatitis C can't affect you if your immune system already has a bulletin that tells us how to kill it when it shows up. Make sense? This is why vaccinations are important in healthcare, among healthcare workers, because we already have these things in our settings. They come in the patients, and the patients often spring leaks, <laughs> right? Some leaks somewhere. So we already have all of this in medicine. We can help control this. We can help control this, and we can help control this. This is what's in our domain. Good? This is why a lot of our facilities are going to require that you're up to date on your vaccinations, because they're trying to prevent this. Okay? Good? Do you guys have a little bit better understanding of the immune system now? and the way infections spread and what we can do in this system. All right, so we have some rules to follow. Now, a lot of people just want to wear gloves all the time in every patient room, every patient encounter, all the time, just as an extra layer of protection. And I get it. I understand why that might be attractive to you, but I'm going to give you a couple of things to think about here. First of all, just like that sandwich worker, do you think that sandwich worker really was aware of everything they were touching? No, they, they just, the rule is wear gloves, make a sandwich. So they complied with the rule. They wore gloves, they made a sandwich. What's the problem here, right? They're, they weren't aware of it. Well, in healthcare, remember, we have pathogens. We know we have them. The patients brought them, and the patients are leaking. So we already know that that's an issue. So we can't just wear gloves routinely without thinking about it because we're going to touch a whole bunch of stuff that we don't mean to 
and we're not even going to be aware of it we're not thinking about it. That is the recipe for disaster. But those gloves really aren't doing what you think they're doing. And I'll prove it. Have you ever seen a birthday balloon, you know, the latex balloon? So you go to one of the stores that have helium, they blow the balloon up, right? It bops up against the ceiling. It's full of helium. Helium is very light. Bops up against the ceiling for a couple of days. But what happens to that balloon after a couple of days? It does. It deflates. Now, how does it deflate? That's the question. That's a question you should be asking. How does that balloon deflate? doesn't evaporate. What happens, and this is kind of interesting, latex is a man-made material. Like all man-made materials, there are holes in it, right? They're microscopic, can't see them. Like if you take your uniform shirt and you hold it up to a window, you can actually see little tiny, tiny holes, right, <coughs> where the sun can come through. That graphic on the door, if you look at it from the outside looking in, you can't see, right? It has little tiny holes in it. If you look at it from the inside out, I've got something on there right now that it kind of diffuse it. But if you look at it from the inside out, you can still see out. <laughs> so we know that man-made materials have holes in them and the holes can be bigger or smaller, but there are holes. So that balloon that we filled up with helium has holes. And as that material stretched, because the helium was in it, what happened to those holes? They got, they got bigger. And over time, now it took some time, but over time, those helium molecules were able to wiggle out through those holes. So the fabric of the, the um, balloon actually let the helium escape. Now, as that helium escapes, the holes get smaller, <laughs> and you end up with this little sad kind of puffy, can't even call it a balloon, right? It was just this little sad puppy. Well, that's because the holes are so small now that the rest of the helium can't escape. And it would stay like that forever. Because latex, you know, the stuff that those balloons are made out of, um, it takes years and years and years and years and years and years to biodegrade. Now, that happens to be the same material that most gloves are made out of. So we automatically know that our gloves have holes and it takes a long time to biodegrade. So if we can fit, now helium is a pretty small molecule. You can't see it with the naked eye, right? Pretty small. But if you can fit 10,000 virus particles on a helium, you really think that hole is going to be a problem for our pathogens? If a helium molecule can make it through 10,000 virus particles can. Now, they've done lots of studies on this, right? Because we're all about evidence-based practice. We want to prove it. We may have a theory, but we want to prove it before we believe it. So they've done lots of studies on this. Uh, let's say that you work in a clinical setting. We tell you, go wash your hands. You go wash your hands really well because you're being watched, and we always wash better when we're being watched, right? You wash really, really good. Get all of those spots. And then you put gloves on and you take care of patients. Well, before you put your gloves on, I actually cultured your hands, right? Took a little swab, took a little culture, put it in a petri dish. You go take care of a patient with your gloves on. And then after you remove your gloves, I come along with a, a little um, swab and I swab your hand again. And it's going to take us three days to get those results. But we're going to see what grows. Every single time pathogens show up. Pathogens get through your gloves. They are not the magic suit of armor you think they are. That pathogen doesn't go, oh, gloves, no problem. I'll go somewhere else. It doesn't work like that. Now, have you guys ever worn gloves for anything? Yeah. What does it make your hand do? Ah, it holds a body, right? So we end up with a warm, because we're 98.6 degrees, dark, moist. So what kind of things grow in warm, dark, moist? Yeah, pathogens, absolutely. So what we did is we put something on that has holes in it, 
let the pathogens slip through and give them the ideal breeding environment. Are those gloves doing what you think they're doing? No. Anybody ever go to the big box store down the road? I won't say the name of it because I don't want to get sued. <laughs> have you ever seen those cashiers back when they had cashiers? Now we have to check ourselves out. But have you ever seen the older lady cashiers that wear gloves while they're checking people out? Right? It cracks me up. Um, they'll work a four-hour shift, put on a pair of gloves, and they'll, they will don't want to touch your ketchup bottle. They don't know where that thing has been. They'll scan all the, the groceries. And at the end of four hours, they get ready to go on break, and they take their gloves off, and they think to themselves, my hands are clean. And they go eat lunch with a side of E. coli because they did not wash their hands because they have a false sense of security. You see how that might be dangerous? Mm -hmm. It'd be much better not to wear gloves and just wash your hands before you eat. Way simpler. Way more comfortable, too. But we do that in medicine as well. We wear gloves when they're not needed because we have a false sense of security. And then a lot of times we don't wash our hands when we take them off because we think they're there to protect us. So what do you think the most important Important action uh, wearing gloves is going to be. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Yeah. Do you see how just a little bit of knowledge can actually put us at a greater risk? Right? We wear gloves. We don't want to touch all that ooey gooey stuff. But actually, if we don't do it right, it puts us at a higher risk. Scary, right? Let's talk about the biodegradable aspect of this. Guys, first of all, I do need a disclaimer here. I am not an environmentalist by any stretch. I drive a sports car and like it. Okay? I, am, I don't cycle. I am not an environmentalist, but this really does impact me. Those latex gloves are biodegradable, but it takes hundreds of years. Most gloves that we use in clinical settings now are not latex because a lot of people have latex allergies. They're usually vinyl or nitrile. Those are not biodegradable. They will be on this planet 100,000 years from now. I want you to think about that. Now, this isn't going to be my problem. Like, I'm out of here in like 30 years, you know? It's not going to be my problem. It will be my granddaughter's problem. Years ago, back in the 80s, we used to burn it all. Every hospital had an incinerator right on site. I loved it because my very first office in the hospital was right next to the incinerator, and I'm always cold. Perfect place for me. But in the 80s, we realized that burning all this plastic kind of ate up our ozone layer, and we need that to live. So we stopped burning stuff. So then we just talked about it. And I put it all in landfills. We'll deal with it later, sometime. And it got to be too much. I mean, these landfills were like overloaded with medical waste. And somebody said, we had to do something. So back in the early 2000s, somebody said, hey, there's a great big ocean out there nobody's using. Let's put all the medical waste in big metal drums, poke holes in the top so it fills with water, sinks to the bottom, take it way out in the middle of the Pacific. There's no land out there. Nobody cares. So we did. We put medical waste in big drums took it, towed it out to sea, filled the drums up with water, they fell down to the bottom, and the bottom is a long way down. And that worked for years and years and years, and hey, it's a great solution, out of sight, out of mind, not a problem, but now the fish that we're pulling out of the northern Pacific have high levels of latex. It's not a naturally occurring substance in the sea. How do you think they're getting latex? Yeah, absolutely. So is that a problem? So we stopped doing that. Now we're back to, uh, let's just stockpile it. Here's the scope of the problem. You know, that one pair of gloves that you're wearing, you may not think twice about it. I wouldn't think twice about it. But when you look at just medical, and I'm just talking medical, I'm not talking about veterinary, housekeeping, manufacturing, dental, I'm just medical, right? Medical. And I'm just going to talk here in the USA, not the other countries, just the USA. 
in America, we use enough gloves in medicine every day to fill a football stadium 35 feet deep. Every day. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that something is going to have to be done about that at some point. And if you're confused about that, watch the movie Wally, the opening scene. We all had to exit the planet because there was too much trash. And a lot of that trash, I tell you what, these people are geniuses that wrote that movie. A lot of that trash in Wally is medical waste. They actually got this. So if we need gloves, let's wear them. It's appropriate. But if we don't need them, why are we contributing to an environmental problem that we don't need to be contributing to? Especially when we have to wash our hands before care and after care, whether or not we're wearing gloves at all. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, the third thing we have to pay attention to is what our gloves touch when, when they're clean and what they touch once they're not. We're going to get into that in a second. So our rule is, if we're not going to wear gloves for everything, we have to know, well, when do we wear gloves? What, you know, what is the situation where we, we need to wear gloves? And I'm going to give you three things to think about for every single skill. The first question you're going to ask is, if I, when I'm doing this skill, is there a possibility I might put something ooey gooey that's not mine? And if the answer is yes, you need gloves. Let's get a, another layer of protection in there. If the answer is maybe, yeah, you need gloves. But if the answer is no, you probably don't need gloves. Let's go to question two. Question two is, when I'm doing this skill, is it possible I might touch personal skin, like the breast area on females, genital area on most sexes, right? This is what we call the bathing suit skin. So if I'm doing this, this skill, is it possible I might be around bathing suit skin? If the answer is yes, I need gloves. If the answer is maybe, I need gloves. If the answer is no, I probably don't need gloves. Let's move on to question three. Question three is, are there any open areas that I might encounter when doing this skill? If the answer is yes, I need gloves. If the answer is maybe, I need gloves. If the answer is no, I don't need gloves. So every single skill I do, I'm going to ask myself these three questions. Ooey gooey, personal skin, non-intact skin. If the answer to all three of those is no, I don't need gloves. Still going to wash my hands before, still going to wash my hands after, but I don't need gloves. I'm only going to wear them if I'm going to be touching body fluid, personal skin, or non-intact skin. Make sense? Good? Questions? No? All right. So, if we're going to take a pulse on this person right over here, she is not leaking anything. She's holding on to all of her own body fluids like a camp. Yay. I'm only touching her wrist. That's not bathing suit skin. And she has no open areas. Do I need gloves? No. Same patient, same skill, still taking pulse. But she has a huge rest on the arm that I'm going to be taking the pulse on. Do I need gloves? Yes. It's not based on the skill. It's based on the patient you're doing the skill on. You guys get that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's why glove rule has to be evaluated for every single skill you do. Now, that open skin also applies to you, okay? So when I'm thinking about my glove rules, okay, I'm going to take a pulse on this patient. Um, she has no body fluids that I have to worry about, no open skin, no personal skin. I don't need gloves. Oh, wait, I have open skin. Now, do I need gloves? Yes. Okay, so that open skin applies to you as well as them. Good? Any questions on glove rules? Does that make sense? Okay. There's also a cost factor here that I just want to incidentally throw in. Gloves are expensive. And, man, they got 
super expensive with COVID, supply and demand type thing. Now the supply is back up, but the price did not go back down. Gloves are expensive. If you are wearing gloves all the time for everything, the employer has to pay for those gloves. They have to buy the gloves and have them available for you. If every staff member is using gloves all the time for things that they really don't need gloves for, that's a huge expense for your employer. Now, you may think, so what? That's an employer. It's not my problem. But when it comes time for raises, that is going to be your problem because they don't have an unlimited bank account. They can only work with the money that they've got. If they only have $100 in the bank and 90 of it has to go to gloves, now all I've got is $10 left to work with, you're not getting a raise. So we have to be aware of how to conserve materials. And a lot of people have this misconception about healthcare that everything is kind of free. It's not. In fact, it's just the opposite. In healthcare, everything is 10 times more expensive than it is for everywhere else. So if you're using extra supplies, your patient's going to get billed for it. Their insurance is going to get billed for it. And anything that isn't paid is going to have to be absorbed by the facility. That's your paycheck, guys. So you use the supplies that you need, but don't go overboard. You have to be aware of this. We have to be um, a good steward of our supplies. Does that make sense? Interesting uh, anecdote for this. Very interesting. There is a new job for RN. Uh, I don't know if anybody's heard this. This is really cool. When you go to the hospital, you get a bill. Now, most of the time, the bill is just like a flat amount. You know, you owe us half of the insurance, you owe us $8,628, right? And you just write out a check for that, don't you? No, so you're going to call and ask for payment arrangements because nobody has a ton of money in their bank account to hand over to a hospital. So here's the problem, right? You don't know what that $8,628 is for. It's not an itemized bill. You can actually call up the hospital and say, hey, I want an itemized. I want to know, why do I owe this amount of money? What did you charge me for? Now, when you get the bill, you're going to have absolutely no idea whether that stuff was necessary or not because you're a lay person. But there is a brand new field of nursing where you can hire a nurse to go through that bill and whatever they save you, they get a portion of. So if they can go through the bill and say, yeah, you did not need 12 wash basins. That was, you know, excessive supply. You only need one wash basin. It gets washed why it's a washed basin, right? allowed to be washed, yeah. right? You only needed one. So they write out this detailed report, send it back over, and the facility has to write off everything that is not medically necessary. You can take that $8,000 bill and get it down to $2,000, and I'll take a portion of it. But I saved you a whole lot of money. So isn't that neat that we have this whole brand new area of nursing that is specifically designed to work for the patient's financial interests? Now, if you're the one that got the 12 wash basins, you just cost that facility a ton of money. What do you think is going to happen to your job? That's right. That's right. So you need to be aware of these um, actions, you know, of the behind the scenes, what's happening, so that you can make the right decisions. I'm plugged into a lot of groups on Facebook, a lot of groups on Facebook, CNA groups, and I see it all the time. Um, CNAs throw out med pans. They, they won't clean them. They just throw them. Those med pans usually cost around $30. How many times do you guys pay a day? Think about that. Right? We, we got to be 
harder than this. Not to mention the fact that all of those things are going to end up in the landfill and we got that whole problem to deal with, right? So we're going to learn how to wash stuff out. Kind of what we did. Good. Questions? Do you guys understand this? All right, so let's go here. The first thing your gloves should touch is the patient. So those of you who want to walk into the room, do your opening, wash your hands, and then put your gloves on, you're going to have to overcome that because those gloves can't touch your supplies. You don't want the gloves to pull the sheet down. You don't want the gloves to put the head of the bed up. By the way, do you think that bed controller is clean or dirty? Who touches it? Everybody. Yeah, that bed controller is not clean. Do you really want somebody to touch that bed controller with gloves on and then put those gloves in your mouth? No. So we have to think about this, right? So we are going to do all of our prep work, all of it, and then put our gloves on right before we're ready to brush. So that means I'm going to do my opening, wash my hands, get my supplies. I'm going to get the head of the bed up. I usually do that during my opening before I wash my hands. That's the smart time to do it. But if I, did, if I already washed my hands, I'll get a paper towel to press the button, right, so that my hands don't get uh, soiled after I've washed them. Um, I'm going to uh, get all of my supplies and lay them out. I'm going to unwrap my toothbrush, dip it in water, and put toothpaste on it. I'm going to get the towel on the patient. I'm going to do all of that, and then right before I start brushing, I'll put my gloves on. Good? Questions? So... If you're performing this stay for you know during the test, if I were to maybe go out of order and say put the bed up um, before I wash my hands or something of that nature, but it still is clean, does that mark off a point because I'm not doing it? Nope, no, nope. you can put the head of the bed up at any time. They're not grading you on when they're grading you on control. Right. Okay. So just make sure that once your hands are clean. You're only touching clean items. Okay, so it's not based on the orders, based off like infection control. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Good question. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then the uh, um, next thing we're going to look at is okay, once we touch the patient, our gloves are soiled, they're unclean. Now, do I really want to touch a lot of other stuff with those unclean gloves? Oh, no. Right? So we don't want to touch the bed controller to put the head of the bed back down. We don't want to touch the sheet. It's going to go right up next to the patient's face. Dirty glove. We don't want to touch um, really anything with dirty glove other than dirty items. So we're going to take all of our dirty items, remove our gloves, and then finish our spill. Now, we do have to wash our hands. Yes. Remember, pathogens can get through. You do have to wash your hands, but it can be at the end of the spill. It's the patient's duty. Trust me, there's cooties all over that bed already. There is. Patients shed them. So we're going to wash our hands at the end of the skill. Patient cooties have to be washed off before we go to the next patient. Good. Questions? And then we have to learn how to remove our soiled gloves correctly. So, oh, okay. Let's take a break. I gotta go get wait a minute, maybe I have one up here. Yeah, I do. Anybody allergic to latex? Okay. So. Can you pass this thing, please? If you don't have yeah. a rinse here, I do not have a tape for that. Okay. All right, that's fine. I also know how to Oh, okay. All right, I'll just use yours then. You're welcome. Okay. So go ahead and put your gloves on.
you want your gloves to fit well, but you don't want to really have to force your hands into them. Because remember, the more they stretch, the bigger the holes get. Right? So you need to make sure that you know what size gloves you wear. These are small. They're too small for me. I'm going to make them work for this demonstration. Um, you also don't want them so big that they're floppy because they may fall off. So you need a nice snug fit where they stay on, um, but not so tight that they have to stretch. Good? Okay. Now touch stuff. Okay, your gloves are now soiled. You touch the patient. In order to remove soiled gloves properly, we have to remember this. Glove can touch glove. Glove cannot touch skin. Remember that. Dirty glove can touch dirty glove. Dirty glove cannot touch skin. So I cannot go underneath. What I need to do is pinch up at the, the wrist here. Don't go underneath. A lot of people want to put that thumb underneath. You just want to pinch up and pull that off inside out. You're going to ball it up in this glove. You don't want floppy gloves contaminating everything. So you want control over it. Now, skin can touch skin, but I can't touch the glove. So don't put your thumb here. Okay, don't touch the outside of the glove. It's only underneath. So we're going to go underneath the glove and pull that off inside out. So one inside out glove is inside the other inside out glove. Say that three times fast. <laughs> um, then you're just going to throw it away. Make sure that you have control over it so it doesn't drip if you're working with liquid. You now have a pair of gloves. You can go home and clean your toilet with. All right. Questions? Do you guys understand glove rules? Yes. You're going to hear this over and over and over and over again because it's part of our big four. It's something that is used for every single skill. Remember, we call it care plan, the whole care plan in. We do our opening. Every opening starts with A. We evaluate gloves, and we do our closing, the six Ds of the closing. Right? Those four, every skill. doesn't matter what it is. You know those four are given. So if you know them, that's four less things we have to learn for each skill. Okay, good. Question? So I told you we're going to learn everything from the back wall, right? Well, so far, we know skill rules, we know opening, we now know glove rules, and we know the closing. We are also going to learn today about the barrier and linen rules and basin cleaning. So by the time you leave today, we're going to have over half of those principles mastered. Pretty good. It's not hard, right? Pretty easy. All right, let's go ahead and take a break. Come back at five after. Oh, Kayla says, I learn something new every day. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. No pearls says, Stephanie, how do you know we have to use four washcloths on certain skills, but may I use five instead? Yes. And I'll actually be talking about this, uh, no pearls. I'll be talking about this a little bit later on in the program next week. Go ahead. You're fine. You're fine. Um, you're not graded on your supplies. You can use whatever supplies that you need, but if you take too, too many, if you're trying to grab a stack of 10, the evaluators will stop you because they only have so many supplies for the entire testing day. So um, you're not graded on how many supplies you use, but having a general idea is good. All right, guys, we're going to go on break, and um, I'll see you back here at 5 after.
You say that she said it with the haters. Why would you post it if you were expecting people to say it with the haters? Did you see that?
All right, any questions on what we've gone over so far? Okay, so we just talked briefly about cleaning stuff, right? You don't want to just throw something away once it's been used, we have to clean it. But think about your sink at home. When you brush your teeth, you probably just rinse the sink out, right? You probably don't pull out the bathroom cleaner every single time you use the sink and sterilize it. You probably just rinse out the big glob, right? That's all we're doing here. We're simply rinsing, drying, and storing because that basin is only used by one person, the patient. So everything that we clean uh, for the test, we will just be rinsing, drying, and storing. That's it. Rinse it out, get the big globs out, dry it off, put it away. We never want to put anything away wet because remember it's in a drawer, so it's warm and dark. And if we leave, put it in wet, we've got pathogen problems. Good? So we do want to dry it off. But the process that you're going to see in cleaning the basin allows for disinfection if it's needed. So there are going to be some times that we're going to have to disinfect things if our patient's on chemotherapy, for instance. So you'll see me in the video I'm about to show you, rinse the basin, dump it out, and then set it down in the sink. If I needed to disinfect it, that's when I would spray it. You can't be holding something with your dirty glove when you're disinfecting it. You can't touch it when you're disinfecting it. Does that make sense? So you're going to see the process, rent, dump, set down. I don't spray it because we're not going to spray anything for the test, but we know when we would spray it if we needed to. I'm going to use the paper towel to pick it up because remember, my gloves are still dirty. So I can't touch that clean basin with dirty gloves. So paper towel to pick it up, paper towel to dry the inside, different paper towel to dry the outside, and then one more to open the drawer and put it away. So you're going to see that. The good news is you're going to see this eight more times. <laughs> so it, by the time we get done with the course, you'll see basic cleaning over and over, and it should start to click in. Okay? Is it possible to take the gloves off and then just wash your hands when you're done after? It is possible unless you're working with body fluids. And in this case, saliva is body fluid. So you actually would get a um, infection control. There is a way to do it. Let me back that up, okay? If you rinse the basin, set it down, remove your gloves, right? But you have to do it at just the right time, yes. But you still have to have a barrier because you haven't washed your hands yet, the basin is the way. You'd still have to have a barrier to pick it up, to dry the inside, dry the outside, and put it away. But yes, you can. There's certainly no problem with that. But it has to be after you rinse the basin. Good? You guys understand why? Okay. So we're going to go over this again and again and again and again and again and again. Don't get too wrapped up in it. Where's my... I don't have barrier. I don't have barrier. Okay. Hold on. I got to get somewhere here. There we go. Barrier. All right. So this is another principle we're going to learn. This is the barrier. And this, if you want to play along, is going to be on page 64. So the barrier is the 
item that goes typically goes over the bed? We're going to talk about the barrier. Okay. So this table, this is called an overbed table. And this is usually what we're going to use if we need supplies for our skill. We have to have a place to put them. Now for the test, get this set up to show you. For the test, your table will be like this. Empty. It's a glorious thing. It never happens in a clinical setting. <laughs> These tables are never empty. They have slapstick and cell phones and food trays and jello for later and water pitchers and all kinds of stuff on them. You're going to have to carve out a small space for you. But the whole point here is that we need a clean place to put our clean supplies. This is not clean. So we're going to use a barrier, something between the table and the clean supplies. Now, anything can be a barrier. You can use, again, I need a production assistant. <laughs> you can use, let me come over here. There we go. You can use a paper towel as a barrier. You can use a bath towel as a barrier. You can use washcloth, a tissue. You can use anything as a barrier. Just something to put on the table that's clean that gives you a clean space for your clean supplies. But for the test, we're going to use a very specific kind of barrier. This. This is called a disposable under pad. Now, what you're going to learn in this class is in medicine, why only have one name for something if you can have two? So almost everything that I'm going to talk to you about during the program will have two names. And that's what I'm going to help you out with. Page 15 of your book has all of your supplies and it has the, the other names for some of them. I think it's 15. Is it 15? On our whiteboard? Yeah. No, this is different. No. Nope. Hold on. I thought I knew. I don't know. 25. 25. Okay, so the technical name for this is a disposable under pad. That's a whole lot of syllables. Nobody ever calls it that. We call it a chuck because it's the kind of under pad that you chuck after you use it. That's how it got its name. Okay, so this is a chuck. Now, this is a little bit different from a washable under pad. This is a washable under pad. And again, everything has two names, right? So this is also called a bed pad. So this is a bed pad. It's washable. This is a disposable under pad or chuck because it's disposable. Both of these are, their its main job is actually to go on the bed and collect whatever your patient is leaking. But they can be used as barriers as well. Good? Questions? Okay. So, when we do our opening, knock, knock, knock. Hi, Miss Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. I need to do mouth care. Is that okay? Yes, great, whatever. You're going to close the curtain, wash your hands. Now you're ready to get your supplies, but you need a place to put them. So the first thing we're going to do is go over and grab a chuck and put it on the table. Now some of you are going to want to grab all of your supplies at the same time because you're over here. It's easy, right? The problem is that if I grab my chuck and I don't put it on the table, I'm going to get the rest of my supplies. This is mouth care. So if we're gonna do mouth care, we need a towel for the patient, right? Go on their chest. We need a basin, toothbrush, and toothpaste. We need a cup of water, which I'll have to pretend because I don't have a cup. <laughs> we have a cup. So we got all of this stuff in our hands, right? Let me get a cup. 
We also need a set of gloves. I'm out of hand. So I'm going to get a set of gloves. Okay. So then I'm going to come over here to my table. Production assistant. <laughs> when I come over here to my table and I'm going to spread this chucks out. I'm in trouble. I can't really spread the chucks out. I don't have enough hands. So let's put those in there. Let's kind of hold on to this. And we're going to spread this out. Do you guys remember I was talking about professionalism? Yeah. That was not professional. Do you think, yeah, do you think that that's going to come off as professional? No. no. Okay, so we have a professionalism problem here, don't we? Mm -hmm. The other problem that we have, other than the fact that I've lost half a toothbrush. Right ah, there it is. The other problem that we have here is that my uniform is not considered clean. It's pressed up against the bed. It's touched the curtain. It's leaned against the sink. It's probably knelt on the floor for foot care. It's not clean. And when I hold all of these things up next to my uniform, I'm contaminating them before I ever start. So the way this needs to be done is you do your opening, you wash your hands, you go get a barrier. It's the first thing you get. You don't get anything else. Just the barrier. You go put the barrier on the table and then go back and get the rest of the supplies because now you have a place to put them. Don't let supplies touch your uniform. Does that make sense? Okay. Good. That's a really, really important concept. Because remember how I said that things on the state exam are counted differently? They're weighted. This is weighted very heavily. Okay, good. Make sense? Sometimes a visual example is much more fun. All right. So you would wash your hands before you grab all your materials? Right, because we need clean hands to get our clean supplies. Make sense? Yeah. Then you'd apply your gloves right after, right before you're about to brush. The right, so I'm going to, let's walk through this. I'm going to first read my care plan, because remember that step one, right? First I have to read my care plan. After I read my care plan, I'm going to do my opening. Hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm in CNA today. How are you? I need to brush your teeth. Is that okay? Close curtain, wash hands. I got clean hands. So I'm going to go get a barrier. Barrier goes on the table, spreads out. Go get the rest of my supplies. They go on the table. A word about water. For the test, there will already be a cup of water on the table for you at the beginning of the skill. There may be a pitcher of water and a cup or a bottle of water in a cup, and you can pour it, that's fine. But generally speaking, for the test, they do not make you go to the sink and get water out of the faucet. But if you do, your hands are already clean. Is that faucet clean? No. So I need a paper towel to turn the water on. Does that make sense? Yes. You always have to be aware of if your hands are clean or dirty. Always be aware of that because it's going to affect how you get water. But for the test, there should be a cup of water or a pitcher in a cup. Okay. So I got all of my supplies. I put them out on my barrier. I'm good to go. I'm ready to start. I'm going to get the towel on my patient's chest. I'm assuming I've already put the head of the bed up. If not, get a paper towel, put the head of the bed up. Put a towel over their chest. Get a toothbrush. Wet it. Put some toothpaste on it. I'm ready to start now. My gloves go on. Do you see how much stuff I had to do before gloves? Yeah. I mean, gloves were like 15 steps in. Don't get too anxious to get your gloves on because then you're a sandwich maker. Okay. Good. Any questions on that? Do you guys understand this? 
holding the principal down. You guys are rolling right along. Rolling right along. All right, so I'm going to show you a... Um, I'm going to show you a video on this. The video is on um, mouth care, how to do mouth care. So it's a skills video. It's going to walk you through all of the steps. You can follow along in your book. But I want to go back real quick. Let me see if I can find it. Hold on. Okay. So let's remember all of the important steps of mouth care. Patient must be sitting fully upright. We're going to protect the clothing. We'll wet the toothbrush before applying toothpaste. We're going to brush all surfaces and the tongue. We'll let them rinse and sit. We're going to leave their mouth and clothing dry. Remember, those are our important skill-specific checkpoints. All right. So bear with me, guys, because I don't remember how I did this on Monday. <laughs> I know, I'm horrible. I'm going to show the video, but i got to figure out the sound. Let's see. Yeah, there was a like that. Okay, give me a second. I gotta figure out sound. Speaker. You guys can hear that. Yeah. On the screen. Yeah. I mean, it's. All right, guys. We'll, uh, we'll try this. Hey, I know there's going to be a little bit of an echo. There's not much I can do um, about the echoey part. I work on that this weekend. You guys are my big pigs on my new platform. I was in Zoom, but I couldn't go to channels, so I'm using this, but I got to work that out. All right. So a little echoey. Hello. Hi, Mr. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Good. How are you? Wonderful. I need to do mouth care. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. I'm going to put the head of your bed up. And then I'll close the curtain, wash my hands, and gather my supplies. Okay. We'll get you to a full upright sitting position for safety. And if I can get you to lean forward, please. There you go. Is that more comfortable? Yes, much. Okay, I'm going to close your curtain and wash my hands now. I'll gather my supplies. I'm going to start with a barrier and we'll place that on your overbed table. I'm going to get a towel, a set of gloves, a basin, toothbrush and toothpaste, and a cup of water. 
We'll prepare the toothbrush first. We'll get it wet, place a little bit of toothpaste on it, and set it in the basin. Mr. Jones, can I place this towel over your chest? Yes, please. Okay. And now I'll apply my gloves. Okay, Mr. Jones, can you open wide for me? I'm going to brush the back on the bottom. The back on the top. And can you bring your teeth together? And stick your tongue out for me. Thank you. Set that aside. Go ahead and take a sip. Rinse your mouth. Let me wipe that off for you. Another sip? No, thank you. Okay. Now I'm going to dispose of my cup, wrapper, and toothbrush. I'll be right back. I'm going to remove the towel and place it into dirty linen. I'm going to go clean the basin and I'll be right back. I'll place the toothpaste in the basin, use the paper towel to open the drawer, and place the basin and toothpaste in the drawer. I'll clean up my work environment and go throw these items away. Now I can remove my gloves. Okay, Mr. Jones, is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? No, A magazine? Idea. No, thank you. Okay, your call light is right here. If you should have any needs, let me know. Can I adjust the head of the bed for you? No, this is great. Okay, I'm going to open the curtain and go wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll think about my skill, make any corrections I need to make, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. No, for the test, the evaluator will play the voice of the patient for you. Yes, you won't have to play both parts. Um, the evaluator will play the voice of the patient. Good question. Like, like, talk, like, like, telling them what you're doing as you're doing. So you should talk out loud. Um, let's think about the patient for just a second, right? So most of our patients are alone. They might have family that comes and visits, but visiting hours are limited. So most of the time they're alone. How comfortable would you be being alone in a strange place? Now, you're also surrounded by strangers. And you're not dressed appropriately. Think about that. What do you think their anxiety level is going to be? Okay, on top of all of that, a lot of the people that come in the room hurt you. Now what do you think your anxiety level is going to be? Okay, one more variable here. 
they don't speak your language. How do you think you would react? So a good analogy is if I picked you up from the classroom and dropped you into Siberia. Dropped you in. No, no people that you know. You don't know the place. People speak a strange language and they're not overly friendly. You're probably going to be pretty scared. And anybody that comes towards you, you're going to get defensive, aren't you? You're going to think that they have the worst intentions in mind for you. Guys, that is exactly what it's like to be a patient. The language that we're speaking that they don't understand is medical. They don't get it. They have no idea what a lot of these words mean. They're scared to death that something is seriously wrong with them. And nobody's taking the time to talk to them. We talk at them. That's a horrible experience for the patient. So when we're talking about what do we need to say to our patients, well, think about their experience. So as much information as we can give them about what we're about to do is going to help relieve their anxiety. So do you have to say absolutely everything that I said in that video? No. You, you don't have to memorize the script. It doesn't have to be word for word. But I certainly am not going near anybody's mouth unless they know why I'm there. I'm going to be brushing your teeth. Can I get you to open your mouth as wide as you can? I'm going to get the back. Okay, bring your teeth together so you front. <laughs> open up and stick your tongue out so I can clean your tongue. Right? I'm going to be telling them every step of the way what I need them to do. I can't just assume that they know what I need them to do. They didn't take the CNA class. They don't know my job. So my job is to help inform them of what I need from them. Does that make sense? But remember, they are scared. They are alone, not dressed appropriately, in a strange place, filled with strange people that are there to hurt them, and they don't speak the same language. This is an incredibly frightening place for your patients. We got to do what we can to help them overcome that. Great question. I have a whole video on that called Do I Have to Talk It Out? Um, and you can watch that video on the main website under Animated Lessons. Okay. Good. I told you I've been doing it for 15 years. You guys cannot ask me a question. I'm not expecting. I promise. I promise. There's a lesson to work on it too. All right. So. If you don't mind me asking. Sure. Hospital do you work at? Sorry, this is more. Do you work at a hospital? Or I don't. I'm a full time education now. Oh. Yeah. This, what I do, uh, I work about 80 hours. Yeah, it's, it's a lot. I know you guys only see me on Mondays and Wednesdays, right? Um, but I own the retail store next door as well. So that takes up some of my time. But all of these videos that you see, I actually do them. They're, they're done right here in this room. I videotape them. Um, and it's multiple camera angles. So that video that you saw was six different takes. So we actually did that video six times for the different video angles. And then I have to edit all that. And I do all of that here. And then I go live. Anybody see my live show yesterday? Anybody see the live show? So the first and third Tuesday of every month, I do a game show for the practice test. It's a practice test for the written test. And I go over 15 questions and you win prizes. So first place gets the CNA card game and a badge holder. Second place gets a badge holder and a bracelet. Third place gets a keychain and a bracelet. Um, so I give prizes and people from all over the, the, actually all over the world tune in. It's a really fun way of practicing for the state exam. Now, I'm not going to have another one until um, September. I canceled the, the one. I got too many things going on. I got to get the book done. <laughs> it's the book. Um, but I also normally go live every Thursday. I'm taking three weeks off of my life. But I normally go live every Thursday where I give a lesson, like dehydration and the elderly. Uh, what's the difference between CPR and BLS and which one do I need? Um, can I work in a hospital? Those are all some of the ones that I just did recently. 
And so you can go on to my YouTube channel and uh, watch through those if you want to. It's the weekly live. Um, I'll be resuming those on your last week of class <laughs> when you graduate. So I'm taking three weeks off. Um, but I do all of that as well. And those require a lot of um, graphics and a lot of pre-production work in addition to going live. Um, I also work with schools. I'm finishing up the book. And all of these, like the banners, I create all that. All of that artwork is done by me. The animated lessons, all of the characters, I create. Um, all of the, the scenes, I do all of our graphic arts. So all of that kind of keeps me right. so busy. Other, other, other places probably pay for your whole course and they just go off of what you have written. Right. So my book is used by schools and hospitals and nursing homes all over the country. Um, we have individuals that go through the program as well. So yeah, we're, we're I know we look very small, a small room, and we're here in Spring Hill. I mean, nothing good happens in Spring Hill, right? But um, we actually are, we operate on a national stage. Right. So it's pretty cool. I didn't, I, I never set out to do this. I was just a teacher in a classroom. I made videos for my students, but they caught on. And then everything has kind of followed that. So I'm an accidental success. <laughs> I'm going to, uh, I actually, it's pretty cool. I, I'm Because I, it still hasn't kind of sunk in that I'm a YouTube celebrity, right? And um, I'm actually going to a conference in October for YouTube celebrities. So it, it's kind of a, a, a neat thing. <laughs> kind of a neat thing, you know? It's, um, I, I like I said, I, I'm an accidental success. I never really meant for this to happen, but... Um, and then I started live streaming my classes out in September specifically for people that wanted to um, take a CMA class but really didn't have the money, right? Because we're in a CMA shortage. I'm trying to get as many CMAs out there as possible. And if you, if you, those of you that called me and you talked to me on the phone, I told you that we have an online program and we live stream, right? And it's the same education. I mean, you guys are actually sitting in the classroom, but you're seeing the same thing. So they're soon, right? So you could have done it for free. <laughs> the big difference is, and this is why I really want you in the class, the big difference is if you're in the class, you have access to practice. Right. The people watching live, they have to practice at home on their own. Right. Um, but you get me. Nice little bonus. <laughs> Question? Okay. So I was like telling my mom, she's a nurse. Um, she's going to be a travel nurse. She's in school right now. She's at ATA. Um, but she, when I was telling her about, like, the, like, not, like, um, opening, she was saying how, like, when you go in, you have to, like, ask the patient, like, oh, can you verify, like, you need your data first so we know where, like, tests look or, like, whatever we're doing with the patient, like, the right person. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Or is that a hospital? Okay. So, everything that I'm teaching you is according, I'm going to trip myself. Everything that I'm you is according to CNA Prometric, which is our testing agency standard, and that's what you see here. And I never ever want you to take my word for anything, I want you to verify everything, right? And I give you all the tools that you need to verify. But if you look at this, okay, look at this, I want you to read step one. This is the actual grading checklist, the actual word that are on the checklist. So read step one there. The resident address by name and introduce self. Okay, does it say anything about asking the patient to state their name and date birth? Okay, so yes, you could do that if you want. That's okay, but that's not what's being graded. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm so yeah, it's, it's a, a good practice, um, certainly. And if you go into a hospital, they may have those requirements. So this is a good time to explain to you the difference between instruction and policies and procedures. Anybody ever go to work? A job? Anybody have a job? Had a job? Ever? Okay. When you went to work, wherever it was, I don't pick a place, I don't care, you had orientation. So people kind of showed you around. This is what we do here and how we do it and where we do it. And some of you probably didn't get much of an orientation. I get it. But 
And somewhere along the line, somebody probably told you about a policy and procedure manual somewhere on a bookshelf and nobody ever pays them any attention. You probably never have actually opened one up and looked at it, probably. Well, the problem with that is that that policy and procedure is the employer's instruction to you. So the care plan is our instruction from the nurse for this particular patient. But what we really need to know is how are things done at this facility? And that's what the policy and procedure is all about. So in a hospital, the policy for identifying patients would be have the patient state their name, their date of birth, and check their ID scan. You might even have to scan it in, right. right, depending on what you're doing. That's their policy and procedure for that institution. Now, if you go into an assisted living facility, their policy for identifying patients is completely different because this is where the patient lives. Right. We're in their home. They're not in our workplace. So that changes everything. So your policy procedure for identifying patients at an assisted living facility is going to be different. Does that make sense? So because the test understands this whole bigger picture, it simply addressed the resident by name. So you were talking about working for agencies when they have their own policies that they follow or theirs as well as other facilities? Yes. So they're going to have their internal policies that usually are more about, um, you know, getting assignments, showing up on time, dress code, professional behavior, that kind of thing. And then you would be responsible for following the policies and procedures of the institution that you're going to. Can you see how that might be a problem if you're an agency worker going to four different agencies or four different facilities and they all operate a little bit differently? So this is the problem that we have with agency work. It's a good band-aid, but it's causing more problems than it's solving. Sure, it's a person to plug into a spot. But what we really need are individuals that are committed to working at this place that are following all of our policies and procedures. Okay. When would we believe that this is a suspicion to like their ADL, but would we ever need to know like CPR or anything else? Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's a good question. So the question is, do we need CPR? And it depends on where you work. I'm going to be very, very honest with you. It depends on where you work. Some places don't require CPR. Some of the living facilities, they don't, they don't have their staff um, CPR certified. <coughs> I feel if you work, of course, I feel if you're just a human, you should know CPR. That, that's just the way I, you know, that, that's my mindset. Um, I used to work for the school system, and I used to train fifth graders to do CPR. I mean, it's not a hard skill to learn. Um, they're usually way better at it than adults because they follow directions. You know, they're still in the mindset of following directions. Adults, you guys want to change stuff. I don't know why, but you do. So it's not a hard skill to learn. However, I do believe that anyone that works in medical should know CPR. Uh, most of your facilities will require it. Now, some places are going to require American Heart Association CPR. Specific. Others are like, I don't care where you get it. Just get me a CPR card. Um, most of them will not allow online CPR, totally online. Now, if you do the, the videos online, but you still physically perform in front of an instructor so they can check you out, that's usually okay. But um, yes, you will need CPR depending on where you work. Some places will provide CPR for you. My work does. Some places do. There's a caveat to that, though. You got to be careful here. And I don't want to say this in a way that disparages employers, but it's something that some employer, a, a minority of employers do, but it's sneaky. And I don't like it. Remember I said we're in a CNA shortage, mm -hmm. right? So if you go to work for somewhere, they're going to want to keep you. They don't want to lose you because they lose you now they've got a bigger shortage so unfortunately they kind of have to get a little sneaky about how they keep you so if your employer provides cpr for you 
they technically don't have to give you the card. It stays on file at your employment. So if you go to leave, that CPR does not go with you. You have to go get on your own order to, to leave. Same thing with medication assistance training. If your employer provides that, you know, if you become a med tech and your employer provides that, they technically, if they pay for it, they don't have to give you the card. So it, it's a trade-off. For some of you, it's a good deal, right? You don't have to pay for CPR. That's good. But if you're thinking about leaving the place that you're working at, you may want to find out, do those certifications go with me or do I need to get them on my own? So it's just something to kind of think about. It's really the only leverage your employer has over you. So we actually are going to start teaching CPR this month. I believe, I'm still waiting on final confirmation. I go on Friday for my instructor certification. My final, I, there's all the classes I have to take to be able to do, to offer CPR. I used to be an instructor years ago. I let it last. I'm getting it back. So I think April 18th, which is Friday, a Friday, two weeks from now, um, will be, uh, I'll be teaching CPR. And it's American Heart CPR, BLS. Um, so if you need CPR, kind of keep that date in the back of your mind, because I will be teaching it either that Friday or the Friday after. April, August. Uh, or, yeah, April. <laughs> August 18th, sorry. That's the day that we'll be providing. I think, tentatively. I'm still, uh, I won't know until I go get my instructor certification, because I don't know if they have to um, ver come and actually verify my instruction. And if they do, if they have to sit in on the first class, I've got to make it um, convenient for them. So I, I don't, I'll let you guys know next week, because I go on Friday. I'll let you guys know next week what our plans are. What's that? There is a fee, yes. And that's because American Heart charges me a fee. Yeah, I was going to ask what's the difference between taking regular CPR lessons and American Heart. Oh, as far as CPR goes, not much difference, but there is a difference between CPR and BLS. So if you are a community member, if you work in a daycare, you work at a bank, you work at a you know, big box store or whatever, and you take CPR, you're not working in medical. It's just plain CPR. Blow into their mouth, up on their chest, make sure somebody called 911 to get some help. That's pretty much CPR. That, that's guys, a four-hour CPR class. There you go. Okay? Get some help. Give them some breath. Thump on their chest. There's a ratio you have to, but no big deal. Now, if you're in medical, we have better toys. So BLS is CPR. You're still going to learn to call 911, blow into their mouth, thump on their chest, still learn that. But we're going to learn how to use some better toys. A mask, right? So we're not physically blowing into their mouth. Um, what's that? The AED, right? Because CPR does not bring you back to life. You guys know that? CPR does not bring you back to life. All it does is circulate oxygenated blood until somebody else comes along with better toys. That's it. That's all CPR does. It's just keeping the body alive, waiting for somebody else to show up that can fix the problem. So you have to learn how to use an AED. So you got to know where to put pads on, how to press the button, and when to press the button. So we got to go over that. we got to learn that, right? So that's the difference. So if you're working in medical, we have a few more toys. So we have to learn how to use it. If you are if you're in the community, you just need to know how to thump on the chest on my moment. You know, pickle aisle alone. Okay. <laughs> Good? If you um, have an issue that needs help with healthcare and you go in there and they just refuse or like you're like I want to do it on my own, but the care plan says they need help, what are you supposed to do? So I'm going to bring you right back to our purple banner skill rules, right? So our skill rules are we um, follow the care plan, the whole care plan, and nothing but the care plan. So this is in direct contradiction to our care plan. So what do we do if we can't follow the care plan? Tell the nurse. That's it. That's it. It doesn't matter why we can't follow the care plan. If the patient says no, if there are no toothbrushes, if a tsunami just came in the front door and we're now flooded, whatever the reason is, doesn't matter. If you can't follow the care plan, you just tell the nurse. 
It's their job to solve the problems, not ours. Thank God for that, right? Paper and he had serving. I've seen, I've seen CNAs and stuff where they give the patient a paper to sign because they they were they were confused. Mm -hmm. Is that is that how do I say? That's not a CNA task. No. No, that would be between the doctor, the nurse, and the patient because they have to explain the consequences of refusing the care. And that's not something that CNA did. But yeah, patients have the right to refuse anything at any time for any reason. Any reason. And it's, it's not the CNA's job to, to give them a paper and make them sign it. That's nurse's. No, now, I, I will, let me back up on that real quick. If the doctor and nurse have gone in and already talked to the patient and explained everything to them, like, I'm, I don't care, you know, I, I don't want this done. If all of that's been done and all they have to do is have you deliver the paper, then yeah, you can deliver the paper, but you can't explain to them what the consequences are. That's a nurse's job. Remember that as a nurse, I can delegate tasks, but it has to be routine on a stable patient. You guys remember that? Routine task on a stable patient. Well, you delivering a piece of paper to somebody is a routine task and they're a stable patient. That fits. That's okay. That's within your scope of practice. But remember, I'm still liable. You guys remember that? The nurse is still liable. Well, if I'm having a patient sign a paper that says they understand the consequences of refusing this, right? If I'm going to have them sign that paper, that means that I expect there's going to be a lawsuit somewhere down the road. That's the whole reason I'm having them sign a paper. I expect there to be a lawsuit. Now, I do not want to find myself on the stand in front of a jury explaining why I thought that this was appropriate to give a CNA a piece of paper to deliver to a patient. I'm still liable. So the chances of me delegating that are really low. Really low. It's something I'm going to take care of because I expect litigation later. Okay. Does that make sense? We don't take those things lightly. We really don't. But we do understand that patients have the right to refuse. They absolutely have the right to. And I'll give you uh, probably one of the most common ones. Diabetic patients with neuropathy. Now, neuropathy, have you ever sat on your leg and had it go to sleep? Yeah. What does that feel like when, when pins and needles? Right? It actually feels like a million fire ants are biting your, your leg. It, it's kind of painful, right? And when you touch it, Oh, it's really painful, right? That is what neuropathy feels like all the time. If the, you know, the, the feeder, they, they're constantly feeling pins and needles like fire ants are biting them. It hurts. And when people touch it, it hurts worse. So foot care is assigned for, to be done on diabetic patients. So I'm going to ask you to go in and do foot care on Mr. McGillicott. You go in to do foot care on Mr. McGillicuddy. He's already got fire ants, you know, biting his feet. That's what it feels like. He's not going to want you to touch him. Now, I need you to look at his feet because he's not going to know if there's a wound there because he can't feel it through all of that stimuli. I need you to do foot care. He's not going to want you to do foot care. So chances are he's going to refuse foot care because it's uncomfortable. Now, my job is to go in and explain why it's worth the discomfort. And while I'm in there, I'm probably just going to look at the feet, which is the whole purpose of asking you to the foot care is to look at the feet. So I'll just cut to the chase, look at the feet. I'm not going to get you involved. But chances are they're going to refuse. Okay. My job is not really to judge him. I know why he's refusing. It's uncomfortable. I get it. I 100% get it. But I want to make sure that he's safe. And that's where my heart needs to be. Not on the task. It's on the patient. Good. Make sense? Questions? Okay, so we know skill rules. We follow the care plan and all care plan and if we can't, who do we tell? The nurse. Every skill starts with the opening, every opening starts with. If we need a clean place to put our supplies, we're going to use a barrier. And when do we get it? First. 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We evaluate if we need gloves yeah. for every single skill. So we find out, are, are they leaky? Am I going to touch personal skin? And is there any non-intact skin? If the answer is no, I don't need gloves. I'm going to wash my hands before and after. And we know how to do the closing. We make sure the patient's clean, safe, comfortable, and cared for. Good? Yes. Makes sense? So we've gone over all of that so far. But wait, there's more. All right. So let's go to page 71. 71. Here we go. Still haven't learned to use this thing. All right. How do we know what to do with each patient? The care plan. The care plan. So if you look at the care plan at the top of the page here, it tells us to dress the resident in a long sleeve, button front, or snap front shirt, pants, and socks. Please notice it does not say anything about undergarments. We follow the care plan, the whole care plan, and... Do we add in undergarments here? We don't know why they're not wearing them, and frankly, we don't care. Not our problem. Tells us the resident is lying in bed and has a weak right arm. The resident is not able to help with dressing, and after dressing, leave the resident in bed. If you look at the very bottom of the screen of your page, it's going to tell you somebody with your level of experience should be able to dress a resident in 14 minutes or less. Guys, it doesn't take 14 minutes to get somebody dressed. This is a lot more time than you actually need. I keep bringing that up because I don't want you to rush. You have all the time here. But if you look at the second position here, you'll see that this is going to be done on a mannequin. Yeah, so... You're not actually going to be undressed for the test, right? They're not going to strip you down to your undergarments and let somebody else dress you. Thank God for that. All right. So um, this is um, this is going to be a mannequin skill. You're going to talk to the mannequin just like they're a real person. The evaluator will play the voice of the mannequin. You're also going to treat the mannequin like she's a real person. Don't grab her by the hair and pull her up. Don't do anything crazy like that. We're going to um, act just like this was, you know, how you would treat your favorite. Good? Supplies for this. You need a barrier for the table. You need some clean clothing. And you need a privacy blanket. We're going to talk about privacy blanket um, next. But I want to talk about the clothing real quick. So this is going to be on page 59, or 69, sorry, 69, one page back. Your patient has the right to wear what they want to wear. What we dress in is an outward expression of how we feel inside, unless you're wearing a uniform for work. Then they take all individuality away. But for the most part, when you get up in the morning, you kind of go, how do I feel today? Is it a sweatpants and t-shirt kind of day? Is it a short and tank top kind of day? Is it a dressy dress kind of day? You know, how am I feeling? What am I going to do? You base your clothing choices on how you feel. Excuse me, how you feel and what you're doing. Make sense? Mm -hmm. But you have the right to choose what you want. Some days I get up and I'm feeling kind of gloomy. I'll probably dress in darker clothing. Other days when I'm feeling really happy and, you know, have a good outlook on life, I've got a bright yellow shirt that I wear to let everybody know that I am feeling good. Right? We base our clothing on our emotions. Your patient does too. 
So you need to ask the patient. This is an incredibly important checkpoint. We need to ask our patient, what do you want to wear today? And they're going to describe an outfit that will be on the um, uh, shelving unit. Now, if you remember, the care plan said long sleeve button or snap front shirt. When they describe the outfit, it's going to be a long sleeve button or snap front shirt, but there will also be a short sleeve shirt on the shelving unit. Make sure that you're getting the long sleeve button or snap front shirt because they're testing do you understand the care plan. Now, the reason for that is that long sleeves are used for more than temperature. Guys, I know it's hot out there. I get it. Man, if, if I had to wear long sleeves, I would be roasting. And you may think to yourself, oh, it's too hot. I'm going to put the patient in short sleeves because those long sleeves are just, it's too hot for that. Don't make that determination. Remember, we follow the care plan, the whole care plan. This whole care plan is telling us long sleeves. Long sleeves are used for more than just temperature. There are some medications that we give patients that make them photosensitive, which means their skin can react to the UV light in, in the sun. And I actually was a victim of this. When I was 18 years old, I was on an antibiotic that they put that little sticker, avoid direct sunlight. You know, at 18, you don't read those things, right? Why would they put that on there? Who cares? I was headed to Daytona. And yeah, that avoid direct sunlight, they actually knew that. Who knew, right? Who knew? They actually mean that. I turned purple because all of the capillaries under my skin burst. I was one big bruise. Yeah. Yeah. And now I'm allergic to that medication. If I take it, all kinds of really bad things happen. So avoid direct sunlight. They kind of mean it. <laughs> Right, so if we have a patient on a medication like that, we need long sleeves to reduce the amount of skin that's exposed to the UV rays. Some conditions may be photosensitive as well, things like psoriasis and um, autoimmune disorders. Sometimes we use long sleeves because the patient has a rash and we're trying to minimize the pathogen transfer. There's a lot of reasons why that care plan might say long sleeves that have nothing to do with temperature. Don't change the care plan. Now, the reason this is a snap front shirt is because if a patient has a weak arm, it's easier to dress side to side than top to bottom. Most of our clothing that we wear is a pullover, right? T-shirt, regular shirt, the scrubs you have on, they're pullover. Well, that requires that you are able to extend your arm to get them through the sleeves. If you have a weak arm or limited mobility, you may not be able to extend your arm to get it through the sleeve. So in that case, we have clothing that buttons or snaps up the front. And that way, when we remove the clothing, we make the stronger arm do all the work and the garment slides right off the weak arm. No motion necessary. Then the garment will slide right on the weak arm. No motion necessary, make the stronger arm do all the work. So to remember this, we're going to use USA first. Undress strong arm first. USA first. It's on page 70 in the middle of the skill. USA first. Or 71. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's on 69 too. It's on the. Yeah, right here. Number uh, nine. USA first. Undress strong arm. You know how you said ask the patient what they want to wear? What if they want to wear shorts? So do you put on them or do you just tell the nurse to sit down? Tell the nurse. So you don't dress them? So do you, so are you sure that that's not too aggravated? Because I've seen like, a lot of people say that and people say that. Like, so you want to put them I wish I could tell you that all the nurses out there were good. I do. I wish I could, I could make this and I can't. So yeah, there are some nurses out there that do not understand their role. They, they just don't understand the role of the CNA. And if you don't understand the role of the CNA, then you really don't understand the role of the nurse, right? Well, if they weren't taught the role of the CNA in nursing, 
school, they're not going to truly understand why you're coming to them. And that can make them aggravated, for sure. Um, a lot of nursing programs treat CNAs like many nurses. We're not allowed to make decisions. That is outside of our scope of practice. That was determined by our state statutes. I don't care what that nurse has to say about it. Our scope of practice is legal and binding. And if they have a problem with you giving them information about the patient that they're liable for, they probably need a little bit of retraining. <laughs> so the amount of information that you're going to have to pass on to a nurse is going to vary depending on where you work. If you work in long-term care, if you work in an assisted living facility, those patients hardly ever change. You know, Henry is Henry. Henry is very stable. There's nothing to report. You may go months without talking to the nurse about him because nothing ever changes. He's just living his best life, right? If you're in a hospital setting, you're going to be talking to the nurse like nonstop because the patients are not stable. If they were stable, would they be in the hospital? No. So these are unstable patients. So they're going to be changing all the time. This one has more pain. This one's refusing to put on long sleeves. This one doesn't want to eat. You know, you're, you're going to be in constant communication. So it depends on what setting you're working in as well and how stable those patients are. Yeah, but I wish I could tell you that they wouldn't get aggravated, but you will have some that are. Yeah. Just remind them. I mean, it, it, this is how I would handle it. You realize that you're liable for that patient or not. So the more information you have about that patient, the better off you are. Put it back on them, 100%. I mean, I, I'm not, you should never be in a hostile work environment, but you can't stand up for yourself. You know, assertive is not aggressive, right? You're responsible for that patient, not me. I have no, beyond the care plan, my responsibility is to follow that care plan. If I can't, I report it to you. That's what the Florida statutes tell me to do. That's your responsibility. I would think you'd want as much information about that patient as you can. And that will usually shut down. Because you're, you're basically telling them, hey, listen, I'll throw you on the bus. Not a problem. Right? Okay. Yeah, I really wish I could tell you everything. All right. So I want to explain to you what happens though, if the patient picks an outfit that doesn't go together. <laughs> because you are judged by the way your face looks. You are. Yeah, well, so here's the thing, right? So if you're walking down a hallway in a nursing home, you've got a whole bunch of people lined up in wheelchairs and none of them match and their hair's all messed up and buttons are mismatched. And I don't have good CNAs. Nobody's paying attention to detail here. You're, you're slapping stuff together. My, my CNAs are not good. You're judged by how your patients look. So if you ask the patient, hey, what do you want to wear today? And they say, oh, yeah, my purple plaid pants and my yellow sunflower shirt. And you're like, oh, yeah, that doesn't work, <laughs> right? You are allowed to suggest an alternative. You can say, hey, what about your white shirt? That would go really nice with those pants. They may say, oh, yeah, that's what I meant, because you're saving them, right? Not everybody has the ability to put an outfit together, by the way. Um, or they may say, no, I want my yellow sunflower shirt. Okay, no problem, no problem. But you still need to let the nurse know, and here's why. If this patient was able to put an outfit together before today and all of a sudden today they're giving you an outfit that does not match, what could that indicate? Yeah, it can indicate some sort of a change, right? And what do we do with changes? We tell the nurse. Yeah, yeah. You may not have to document it. A lot of places don't let CNAs write words for documentation, only numbers, pulse, respiration, feeding. Um, so, yeah, you may not be able to document it, but you definitely need to tell the nurse because it's a change. Maybe they have a urinary tract infection, which causes confusion. Maybe they're having a stroke. Maybe their blood sugar is low. Right? There's a lot of reasons that could cause them to insist on an outfit that doesn't match. But it also could be this simple. Their son and daughter are coming to visit today. The daughter bought the pants. The son bought the shirt. That happens, too. 
Right. So it may not be a medical problem. It may just be a visitation problem, but we don't know. So we're going to report it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You are allowed to suggest an alternative though, so that your patients look nice. And some people just don't have the ability to pin out the children. Anybody ever been in a hundred year old house, like a really, really, really old house? Closets are only this big and they were for two people. I mean, how does that work? Like, that's not big enough for a baby's closet anymore. I have an entire room devoted to clothes. I call it a walk-in closet, but it's a room. Right? We didn't have that 100 years ago. 100 years ago, you only had three outfits. One you wore today, one that's being washed because you wore it yesterday, and your Sunday best. You wore it to church, weddings, and funerals. Once it got a little shabby, it worked, it worked its way into daily wear, and you got a new Sunday best. Right? They didn't have Dollar Generals on every other block with $3 t-shirts. That, that wasn't a thing. Right? So if you grew up in that environment, you never had to pick out clothing. You only had to choose from one. This is it. This is all you've got. So we need to understand that some of our patients don't have the ability to put outfits together because their life was very different than our experience. Good? Make sense? Guys, here's a scary thing. I actually am old enough to remember when there was not a Walmart. Scary. Right? Scary. Yeah. So we have to remember that your experience is not the same experience as those you're going to be taken care of. These are great conversations, by the way. Great conversations to have your, with your patients. Okay, so everybody got that? USA first. So we can suggest an alternative, but honor their wishes. Remember that yellow sunflower shirt does not go with those purple plaid pants. And we're going to remember to undress the strong arm first. We've already talked about um, the barrier. So this, uh, this is what I went over earlier. I just moved it up to talk uh, during um, mouth care. But remember that overbed tables are used for meals and to hold everything else, and they're not considered clean. So we want to make sure that we get our barrier first before we get our clothing so that we have a clean place to put that clothing. Um, and not set it directly on the table. So now I want to talk to you guys about privacy blankets. So for this particular skill, we know that the patient is going to be undressed. I mean, that's the whole point. We're getting them dressed. And to get dressed, you have to get undressed. Do you think there's a privacy issue there? Yeah. Yeah, exposure. So over here. So we know we're going to dress the patient and we know we have to do our opening. So knock, knock, knock. Hi, Ms. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. I'm here to get the dresses out again. Right? We know all this. And then we're going to close the privacy curtain. Now, we know we're going to undress the patient. We know we're going to dress the patient. Privacy curtain needs to be closed. That's, that's all fine. But who is that privacy curtain protecting the patient from? The, the roommate. If they were at the door, bed, not the window. Okay. So it could be the people out in the hallway. Mm -hmm. Could be the roommate, right? So kind of the public at large, right? Okay. Where am I? You're looking at her. Okay, aren't I a stranger as well? Does that privacy curtain do anything to protect the patient from me? No. So we can't rely on privacy curtains alone as our sole source of privacy for the patient. It blocks their exposure to the public. It does not block their exposure to me. And I am still a stranger. 
Does that make sense? Now, there's also a temperature problem here. Now, I'm standing up. I'm fully clothed. I'm very active. In fact, I would say that I perceive the temperature in this room different than you do because you're sitting down. So what would you call this temperature in the room right now? Yeah, it's cold. Yeah, most of you guys are all wrapped up in jackets. I'm actually warm. Yeah, because I'm moving. I'm up. I'm active, right? So my perception of temperature is way different than yours. Now, if I, one of you guys, stripped you down, put you in a hospital gown, and put you in this bed under the sheet, now what's the temperature feel like? Really cold. Oh, yeah, freezing. Now, let me take this away. <clears throat> I'm shake. Yeah, this is a serious temperature problem, isn't it? The problem is you're not going to think about it. That's the problem. It's because you're not going to think about it. You're, st you're warm. You're running around like a chicken with your head cut off. You are fully clothed. You are not going to think about how cold it is for that patient. So I need you to kind of put that into your mind. Always think about the patient's point of view here. And that's why we need a privacy blanket. Because if I'm going to take the sheet away from the patient, I need to give them something that's going to cover them and keep them warm while we do this skill. And that's what I'm going to use a privacy blanket for. So when I get the blanket, the privacy blanket. Do I want to hold it up against my uniform? No. Why? Okay. I'm going to hold it away. I can get it at the same time I get all of my other supplies and put it on the, my barrier. That's fine if you want to do that. No problem. But when I'm ready to spread it out on the bed, I've got to be super careful here. You do not want to snap it or take it like you do at home. So if I take this um, blanket, and I kind of take it out like this and spread it over. See all those fuzzies? Those are dead skin cells, yeast, and bacteria that came off of that patient. And I brought them because I snapped it. It created a vortex that brought all of those things right here where I can breathe them right in. Now, if you do this at home in your own bed, it's no big deal because you're only breathing in your own funk. But I am not going to do that with a stranger because I don't want their junk punk, right? So when you're spreading a blanket or a sheet or anything, we don't want to create a vortex. I used to use powder on the bed to demonstrate that because it does demonstrate it really well. But um, then I would cough for the next half hour. <laughs> so, so when we're spreading a privacy blanket, we go get it off the shelf. We bring it over to the bed. It's folded. We want to unfold it and lay it over the patient. And when we do that, then we're going to pull the sheet down underneath. Don't remove the sheet first, because if you take the sheet off the bed and then put the blanket on, your patient was just exposed. You need to put the blanket over the sheet and then pull the sheet down underneath. So they remain covered. When you're all done, you're not going to take the blanket away and leave them exposed. You're going to pull the sheet up over the blanket and then remove the blanket from the bed. Anything we remove from the bed, we're going to ball up so that the trailing edges don't contaminate other surfaces. If I just pull this off, I got lots of plunk going everywhere. Okay. Good? So when we remove it from bed, we're going to ball it up and put it into the dirty linen. Questions? That's dirty linen. Do they actually dress the patients like if there's a blanket over them? Like, I'm confused on how I want to Say that one more time. Please, how are you supposed to dress the patient while it's in a blanket? So you're going to move the blanket as you need to. Um, we're going to try to minimize exposure whenever possible. So minimizing exposure means, so remember our care plan said we're going to put on a long sleeve button up front or center front shirt, pants, and socks. So I'm going to start at the bottom just because that's how I do it. It makes it a little bit easier because here's the thing. We have put pants on, right? That means we got to pull the pants up over the butt. If the patient is laying flat, they can lift their hips. 
or I can roll them side to side. Pants go over the butt pretty easily that way. But if I've got the head of the bed up and they're sitting on their butt, can't really pull the pants up. Make sense? But it's easier to put a shirt on with the patient sitting up. So I do the socks, then the pants, put the head of the bed up, and put the shirt on. So I'm going to do this in stages. So when I'm putting socks on, the only thing exposed are their feet. When I'm putting the pants on, I'm going to keep the blanket over them as much as I can and just kind of shimmy the, the pants up underneath the blanket. And then when I sit them up, I'm going to tuck the corners of the blanket behind their shoulders so that as I'm dressing, I'm not exposing them. And remember, it's button or snap front. So I just bring the two tabs together and snap them over the blanket and then just pull it out. I'm going to show the video right now. Would the same procedure would it be the same? Would it be the same? Would a privacy would fit over them and then washing them as you go along? Right. And we're going to go over that on week three, giving a part of that. Yep. Yeah, and that's exactly it. So we're going to use a privacy blanket anytime the patient is uncovered or undressed. So we would use it for um, partial bed bath. We're going to use it for carry care and catheter care. We're going to use it for bed pan. So anytime the patient is uncovered or uncovered. So here's our privacy. It's also on the back wall. So we're going to use the privacy blanket to keep our patient warm and provide privacy. We use it any time a patient is uncovered or undressed. We pull the sheet down underneath. Remember, don't leave your patient uncovered. You're going to um, make sure when you put it on, you unfold it. Don't snap it or shake it. And we're going to remove it at the end of the seal after we remove our gloves because we don't want to pull that sheet up with oil gloves. Good? You have this in your skills book. On page 70. Page 70. 70. Okay, so let me show you this video. Very good, Tanya. Yep, Tanya, you've got it. Under a strong arm first. USA first. Very good. Very good. Oh, that's sweet. Wonderful videos. You're doing amazing work for us, and we appreciate it. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And then we have a little Mr. I've been using your video tutorials in combination with in-person classes here in Florida. It's been so fun. I'm taking my state exam soon. Oh, awesome. Colin Ann. So good vibes out here. You're going to do fantastic. All right. So let me show you our video. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Good. I'm here to help you get dressed. Is that okay? Okay. I'm going to close your curtain. Let me go wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. The first thing that I'll get is a barrier to put on my table to make sure that my supplies remain clean. Mrs. Jones, what would you like to wear today? Your light pink pants and dark pink shirt? Okay. Is this the outfit that you described? Wonderful, I'll get a privacy blanket as well. Okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to spread this privacy blanket out over you. This will keep you warm and help protect your privacy as we do this skill. I'm going to carefully unfold the blanket, being careful not to snap or shake it as I lay it out over you. 
Once the blanket's in place, I'll pull your sheet down to the end of the bed. Okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to place your socks on now. We'll take one of the socks, scrunch it all the way up to the toe seam, put it over the foot, making sure the toe seam is lined up, lift from below and support at the ankle, and smooth the sock over the heel. Now we'll go to the other side. We'll scrunch this sock up, put it over the foot, making sure the toe seam is lined up, lift from below and support at the ankle, and smooth the sock over the heel, minimizing wrinkles. Now we'll help you put your pants on. We're gonna make sure the tag is in the back. I'm going to insert one of my arms into the legs of the pants and scrunch it up so I have control over all the material. We'll then place it over your foot, lift from below, and smooth it over your heel. We're going to repeat on this side. I'm going to put my hand inside to scrunch up the leg of the pants, and then place it over your foot, lifting from below and supporting at the heel while we finish putting on your pants. Okay, Mrs. Jones. Now I'm going to lift your pants up over your hips. If I can have you raise up your hips as high as you can on the count of three. One, two, three. I'll make sure that your pants are over your hips and then cover you back up. Okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to elevate the head of the bed now. Please tell me when you're comfortable. And if I can assist you to lean forward, I'll untie your gown. Thank you. I'm going to tuck a corner of the blanket behind your back as you sit back. And now I'll remove the gown from this side. We're going to undress the strong arm first. Since our care plan indicated your right arm is weak, we'll undress your left arm first. I'm going to the other side of the bed now. Okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to undress this arm. Being careful to minimize the movement and support the arm at the elbow as I lift it off the bed. We'll remove the soiled gown. We'll go ahead and rest your arm back on the bed. Okay, now I'm going to assist you with your shirt. I'm going to scrunch up the arm of the sleeve and put my hand through backwards, keeping your arm supported on the bed. I'm gonna lift your hand and hold it as if we're shaking hands. This will keep all your fingers together as we place the sleeve over my hand and then over yours. Once we have the sleeve in place on your arm, we'll extend your arm out. I'll support at the elbow as I bring the sleeve the rest of the way along your arm. If I can have you sit forward, Ms. Jones, let me assist you. Thank you. Make sure that you remain covered and smooth the shirt along your back. Come on back, Mrs. Jones. Thank you. Okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to assist you in putting your other arm in your sleeve. So I'll scrunch it up, put my hand in through backwards, and Ms. Jones, if I could have you reach your arm up and back for me. I'll assist you to put your arm in the sleeve. Okay, Ms. Jones, we'll rest your arm back on the bed now while I straighten your shirt and make sure that it is snapped appropriately. Okay, let me just adjust your clothing to make sure it's neat. Can I have you lean forward for me, please? Thank you. And I'll make sure that this blanket can be removed. Okay, Ms. Jones, I'm just going to gather up your privacy blanket and place it in soiled linen along with your gown. I'll be right back. Okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm just going to adjust your clothing for neatness and appearance and make sure that it's fastened appropriately and that you look good. Very nice. Okay, you have your call light here if you should need anything. Can I get a magazine for you? Okay, I'm just going to throw your barrier away. 
and open your privacy curtain. Now we'll go wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll think about the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. All right. Any questions on that? Looks pretty easy, right? Should she have been covered back up with a sheet or not? That's a very good question. So our rule of thumb is the patient needs to be covered either with a sheet or clothing. So once we take that privacy, once they're fully dressed, we take the privacy blanket off, it's up to the patient. So, and you heard me ask, you know, do you want the sheet? But most people that are fully dressed don't cover back up and lay down. You know, if they were going to stay in bed, they would just stay in a gown. Does that make sense? So chances are this patient is probably getting up to go somewhere after the season ends, but we don't get to see that part of it. And like a baby. Okay. I have a question. Why did you not wear gloves? Okay. Great question. So we have to go back to our glove rule, right? So this particular patient is a mannequin. Oh, that's you. So is she leaking anything? No. Okay. If it was during the test, it would give us a hand to another light. So for the test, we'll have a mannequin. Okay. And they're not leaking anything. But let's let's go a step further. Let's say it's a real person. Okay. It's not a mannequin, it's a real person. If she's not leaking anything and we're not near any personal skin, remember that, um, that no undergarments, right? Your plan said no undergarments or did not tell us to use undergarments, right? So we're not near personal skin. If there's no non intact skin, if all their skin is intact, we need gloves. Okay. Now, if they were incontinent, would I need gloves? Leaking yes. urine. Yes. Yeah, I mean, because they're leaking, right? So if they're leaking, you need gloves. If you're going to be near personal skin or touching personal skin, you need gloves. But I did not touch her breast when I dressed her. Did you notice that? Mm -hmm. The blanket stayed on top of her. I brought the shirt on around the blanket, so I didn't touch her breast. And she doesn't have any non-impact skin, so I don't need gloves for this scale. So the question you're really asking here, though, is can I wear gloves during the test if I'm not sure? That's really what you want to know. What if I grab gloves and I don't need them? What if I make a mistake? Well, during the test, it's not a problem. You can wear gloves for any skill that you want. It's perfectly okay. But if you're wearing gloves for all skills, at some point, they're going to tell you you don't need gloves for that. Because they're trying to see, do you really understand infection control? Or are you just wearing gloves for everything like the sandwich people? That's really what they're trying to grade you on. So you kind of have to understand those glove rules so that you don't get caught in that net. Okay. Good. So let's just see. Did I do this right? Let's look at our checkpoints and see. Based on the video we just saw, did I do this right? Did I ask the uh, mannequin about clothing preference? Okay. Did I get the clothing before I undressed her? Yes. Oh, why would that be important? Because you yeah. Can... Right. You don't want to expose. Well, I mean, that's uncomfortable, right? So... Remember I said that anything that is order sensitive, which is what you were asking, you know, what if I do things in the wrong order? I'll point out to you, well, we see a four here. So that's going to be order sensitive. Um, did I support all joints when lifting? Did I um, undress the strong arm first? Did I gather the sleeve and dress the weak arm first? Did I... Um, so did I overextend or force movement or injure the patient in any way? Did I adjust the clothing to make sure it was neat? Yes. Did I put dirty items in the 
camper. And did I put this call light in the stronger hand? I'm not sure. We're not sure, right? So we're not sure. So if you go back and watch the video, I did. I put the call light in the stronger hand. But you can go back and verify. Watch the video. All right. Any questions on that? Oh, this is a very good question. All right, I'm going to bring this one up. Okay, so Latasha asks, when dressing the resident or patient, are you able to adjust the bed so you don't put pressure on your back for the bed being so low? So the question is, can you raise the bed to a comfortable working height? And that's a very, very good question. So this particular bed raises up to a comfortable height. So if I did not want to bend while I'm dressing her, I can raise the bed up. Now, when I say that the bed raises, I mean the bed raises. <laughs> Older beds don't go up quite that much. And that one's a crank bed, so it's definitely not going up that much because I'm not cranking it. So, yeah, these things go way up, right? They go way up. And I can't, this would be uncomfortable for me because I'm short, but I can raise this bed to any height I want to during the skill to make it comfortable for me so it doesn't put pressure on my back. And Latasha, you're absolutely right. Yes, you can. The problem is, I'm going to go through this a little bit more later in the program. So I'm just going to give you a teaser here. When I raise this bed up, what I'm really doing is moving the floor away from the patient. So if this patient goes to get out of bed, they're not going to expect the floor to be that far. When you go to bed at night, that floor is always right where you left it the next morning. It's never moved a day in your life. When you're groggy first thing in the morning, you swing your legs out, you expect that floor to be there because it's always been there. It's never moved. But if this patient who's groggy and probably medicated and sleep deprived, remember all that? They got to swing their legs out of this bed. Is the floor right where they left it? They're going to fall. Yeah. They're not going to think to look for the floor because the floor has never moved. So when you put the bed up, what do you think you need to do at the very end of the scale? All the way to the lowest position. And remember, good enough is not good enough so we can't get here and say, yeah, it looks about right. Nope. We're going to keep. There we go. Has to stop moving. So great question, Latasha. Great question. All right, any others? My battery died. I'm going to come up with a better solution for that. Yeah, the problem is that, um, and yes, I have. They do have the ones that follow me around the room. The problem is that the output, the, the wire coming out of it to run to this thing is the same wire that I have to plug the motion one into. So I have to use one or the other. I can either have multi cameras or I can have one that follows me. <laughs> so would it just follow you or would it follow anyone? It might follow, yeah. Yeah, they're they're not always sensitive. So I just got to work on a solution for moving the camera. Right. Really, right? I don't know. I haven't checked into that, but I know they have. This is the wireless controller. I know they have a wired one. So I'm probably just going to get a wire. So my battery is All right. So any questions on dressing a resident? All right. So let's go to page 35. This is our last video for today. Hey, YouTube guys, if you can give, do me a favor, if you like this lesson, can you give me a thumbs up on YouTube that lets YouTube know that you like our content? And it helps me out tremendously. All right, guys, so the care plan at the top of this page, page 35, 
This is measure and record pulse. It tells us the patient will be lying in bed for the skill. Take the patient's radial pulse. And then it tells you where the radial pulse is. Measured at the wrist for one full minute and record your reading. So there are lots of pulse points on the human body. You've got the radial at the wrist, which is the one it's telling us to take. You've got brachial here in the inner elbow region. Um, we're going to get into that on Monday when we take blood pressure. You've got an axial pulse underneath your arm. You've got an apical pulse, which is listening to the heartbeat. You've got a carotid pulse right here, which is what a personal trainer teaches you to do when you're checking your heart rate when you're working out. You've also got a femoral pulse in your groin. You, yeah, you've got a popliteal pulse on the back of your knee, and you've got a dorsal pedalis pulse on the top of your foot. Lots of pulse points, right? But we follow the care plan, the whole care plan, Anne. So this care plan tells us exactly what pulse to use, the radial pulse. If you remember on Monday, I told you this is the most failed skill. You guys remember that? Because people don't take the radial pulse. Or they don't count for one full minute. Or they don't record their reading. This is a simple skill. But the checkpoints count big for all of it. Right? Because we're showing that we understand how to follow the care plan. Got it? Make sense? All right, so this tells us to use our, our patient's radial pulse measured at the wrist. Let me show you where a radial pulse is. If you put your hand out like you're going to shake somebody's hand and your thumb is pointing up, this part right here, where your, this down, where your wrist and your thumb join, right? Right way, way up here, not down here. It's like right where your thumb and your wrist join at the, the bendy part, at the line. There's a bone that runs right there. You guys feel that bone? Feel that bone? If you put two fingers, don't use your thumb. Never use your thumb to take a pulse. If you have a, a artery in your thumb, you'll get your own pulse. It won't help. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a bone right there. If you put your fingers on that bone, stand them up like you're going to dive off a cliff, right? Stand your fingers up on that bone and then just roll them forward. Put your thumb on the back. You should feel some thumps under your fingers. Because what we're doing is that artery runs right underneath that bone. So we're finding the bone, and then right below it is our artery. And, well, you're too high. <laughs> you're too high. We have to roll forward. Roll forward. There we go. Okay. So the bone, so those of you at home, this is my thumb right here where it joins my wrist right here. There's a bone. If I stand my fingers up on that bone and roll forward and put my thumb on the back, you see where my fingers are. That is where your pulse is, your radial pulse. So you should feel thumps under your finger. Now, it's important to put your thumb on the back. See how my thumb is on the back? If you put your fingers there, you'll feel it. You'll feel the pulse. It's not a problem. The problem is that how long do I count for? Yeah, your fingers will relax. Your fingers get lazy. They absolutely get lazy. And then when your fingers get lazy, you lose the pulse. By putting your thumb on the back and your fingers in a C shape, you are holding consistent pressure and you're not going to lose the pulse. Okay. Did you find yeah, yours? Did you feel it? Usually your dominant, if you use your dominant, it's more sensitive, right? But you can use either one. Did you feel yours? I did on this hand, bro. Okay. Are you right handed? Oh, that's why you're feeling better over there. Because this isn't a dominant hand. But if, if you wanted to find it, it's going to be right there. I'm on the back. And hold a little push. Did you find it? Find it? Find it? Good? Did you find it? Yeah, I'm wondering if it's, it's not like here. It's not like here. It's going to be right there. Put your thumb on the back. I feel it very slightly. Like okay. Very late. You might want to pull it a little bit harder. Okay, yeah. I feel it. Yeah. Got it? You feel it? 
Okay, so a couple things with this. When you're taking the pulse, don't use the flat part of your fingers. You want to use your fingertips. Fingertips have way more nerve in them, way more sensitive. So if you notice what I do here, okay, I've got my finger. I don't lay them flat. This is not correct. I bend my knuckles. Bend your knuckles so that your fingertips are what's getting the pulse. Not flat. Bend your knuckles so your fingertips get the pulse. And that will improve your sensitivity. You'll be able to feel it a little bit better by using your fingertips. Don't use your thumb. Okay. Everybody with me? All right. So now I want you to find somebody else's pulse. Just grab a partner and just see if you can feel somebody's pulse. Yeah, don't count. Just find it. Don't count. Just find it. Okay. Can I get you to move your chair in just a second? You're going to move your chair over here. I'm going to rearrange the room real quick because we are going to take a pulse. Now. Two different things. Oh. Right, right. 60 to 100 is normal. So, okay, the question is, guys, what is normal value? So if you, and we're going to get there in just a minute. But if you look here at the bottom of the page, right here, you'll see normal values from 60 to 100. Now, this is a documentation skill. So you would measure and then you would document. In order to be accurate, you need to be within four beats of the evaluator's reading. So if they get 76 and you get 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, or 80, you're considered accurate. I mean, that's a huge margin, right? But um, we need to be within four beats of the evaluator's reading. So the next question is, well, how does the evaluator know what the pulse is? Well, for the test, you've got a patient laying in bed, live patient, real person laying in bed. You're on one side of the patient getting the pulse, and the evaluator is on the other side of the patient getting the pulse. Okay? Now, in Florida, we have how many evaluators? Two. You may have to count twice, once with each evaluator. Okay. Good. All right. So what I'm going to actually, okay. So what I'm going to do, we're going to stay there. I'm trying to figure out how to do this with, for the most amount of room. Um, I'm going to move your table forward. Thank you. Come on forward. Okay. You can come over here and bring your, your chair here. And I'm going to have, you're just going to turn around so you're facing them. Okay. So turn around to face them. I'm going to ask, um, let's see here. I'm going to have you come over here and sit in the red chair. And I'm going to have you come over here and sit in this chair. And then I'm going to steal the black one from you. Thankfully, we have just the right amount of people today. I love it when it works out. Okay, and you're going to come over here and sit right here. All right, so, nope, just you. Okay, so the way I've got this room set up now, we have two people on one side of each table and one person on the other, right? So the single people, 
single people. You are the patient. Patient, patient, patient. So yeah, all the single ladies. Yeah. Okay, so you're going to turn around and face them. And patient, all my single people, you're going to put your arms out on the table, palms up, and relax. So you're going to find the pulse on this hand, and you're going to find the pulse on that hand. Okay, you're going to find the pulse on this hand, find the pulse on that hand. Right now? Right now. Go ahead and find your pulse. So, yeah, you, you can. There's a couple of different holds that you can use. So you've got the guitar hold here. You want to come down just a little bit. Guitar hold, which you're coming up from underneath. Or you could, like, go bring your hand this way and go over that way. So either way, whatever's comfortable for you. Okay. Remember, you want the thumb on the back side of the hand. Otherwise, you're going to lose the count. So, do you have it? Do you have it? Okay, do you guys have it? Got it? Don't start counting yet. Do you have it? Everybody have the pulse. When I say start, you're going to count the thumbs you feel under your finger until I say stop. Okay? No matter what number it is, just keep counting the thumbs you feel until I say stop. I'm going to do the timing for you. But this gets you um, comfortable with the mechanic of, of taking the pulse. Ready? Everybody understand the assignment? Count the thumb. Ready, set, start. What'd you get? Okay, very good. Very good. If you were more than four beats off of your partner's reading, it means we need more practice. So let's practice. You are now the patient. Two arms out. You are now the patient. Two arms out. You're now the patient. Two arms out. You're now the patient. Two arms out. No, you can stay right there. Find the pulse on the hand assigned to you. That's fine. When you have the pulse, when you have the pulse, say yes. Yeah, how'd you find it so quickly? Press a little bit harder. There you go. Okay, everybody ready? No? Okay. Okay, so are you right handed? Okay, so leave her here and bring her hand over. There you go. Okay. Got it? All right, ready? Start.
stop. Or I'm sorry, get. Oh, it's 58. Oh, it's 58. That's 60. Okay. I got 80. What you guys get? Okay. All right. Last person is now the patient. When you find the call, say yes. Yeah, no, it's not down here, it's way up here. The thumb. Yeah, just the right. Oh, now I feel Got it? Got it? Yeah. Everybody ready? Wait, no, I lost it. Okay. Nervous. You're yep, you're too low to go up toward the roof a little bit. Oh, up this way. There you go. <laughs> Got it? Okay. Ready? Set. Start. My <laughs> and okay, how'd you guys do? Okay, how'd you guys do? Okay, and I know you lost count. Okay, good. Okay. All right. So go ahead and get back to your seats real quick. I know I'm I'm gonna be about three minutes late, guys. Just bear with me. All right, do you guys understand how to take a pulse now? Yes. Okay. Um practice really is the name of the game here. If you get 60, I want you to recount because if you were staring at the clock, you were counting seconds, not the pulse. Our brains are hardwired to interpret stimuli in a certain order. Your brain will always pay attention to what it sees first, then what it hears, then what it feels. Feeling is way down on the list. So if you're staring at the clock, your brain will automatically count the seconds. Try not to stare at the clock. Take a starting point. Count for one minute until the second hand really, uh, you know, goes back around to that point and then say stop. For the test, you have to say start and stop just like I did so the evaluator knows when to start counting and when to stop counting. Makes sense, right? This skill does require documentation. So after you count, you would document during your closing and then you're going to wash your hands again after documentation. You guys remember that? Any questions on what we've gone over so far? All right, please remember. Yeah, I didn't go through all that with you. All right, please remember that um, um, you have two chapters of homework to do tonight, chapters two and three, so just kind of keep that in mind. I got to print out your review sheets, so give me just a second, and I'll give you your review sheets, and I have a question real quick that I want to flash up on the screen and answer. So um, give me a second. what's your question? Oh, my name? I'm sorry. <laughs> I should have told you. You can just call me Miss Patty. It's what most people call me. Um, Patricia is my name. Uh, either one works. Hey, you. I respond to that, too. 
Okay, so here's our question. If the patient has, say, stiff or uh, stiff like hands or feet or a locked in a certain position, that's called contractures. When, you know, the joints are bent, fixed, they don't move. They're very, very stiff, right? She's asking, how do you address someone like this? Um, you would want the nurse to help you the first time to for accommodations for that patient. I can't give you a one-size-fits-all answer. The big thing is not to overextend the joints. Don't try to force them back into a straight position because they won't be. The tendons are actually um, sh too short for that. You'll end up tearing the patient's tendons and ligaments, and that can be very bad. So don't overextend. Be as gentle as possible. And if you need specific help, go to the nurse for that patient. They're the best source of information, okay? All right. Good job, guys. I really, truly appreciate it. You did a great job today. Let me um, get to your review sheets. Those of you uh, in the YouTube world, you can go to my website, courses.4yourteamate.com. Review sheets are the first lesson. So next time, happy caregiving. No live tomorrow.